Uh, good afternoon and welcome to the afternoon session of the online platforms market inquiry public hearings and it's day two of week three and this afternoon we're dealing with um, property classifieds as we have this morning and we have property 24 and I have with us from property 24 JP Farina who's the CEO and then I also have um, Shord Nicolin, who's the OLX South Africa General Manager. And as we understand, OLX is the holding company or division that um, holds Property 24. So welcome, gentlemen. Thank you very much, Mr. Hodge and Ms. Sepe for having us at the Commission. Um, yeah, thank you for allowing us to present to the public. Great. Well, I'm not going to um, stand in your way. Why don't you put up your presentation and, and take us through it? And then the panel will have some questions. I will do. Give me a second. All right. Are you seeing the presentation up? We are. You can go ahead. Great stuff, thank you. Um, so good afternoon, everyone, um, and members of the technical panel as well. Thank you so much for having us at the Commission and, and giving us an opportunity to present um, to the public. Um, as as uh, Mr. Hodge has already um, introduced, I'm JP Farina. I'm the CEO of Property24, been running the business for the last 11 years, joined by Shurt, who's the GM of, uh, of EMEA at OLX. Um, the agenda for today, uh, in this presentation at least, is, um, is a few items. I'm going to go through, which I actually think is quite relevant um, for the public and the Commission, just a live demo and user case um, on Property24, some history and context, uh, the competitive landscape, the products that we offer our agent customers, and some strategic considerations. Uh, Property24 is a vertical classified platform for the advertisement of properties for sale and rent. So what we mean by vertical is that it focuses on one co consumer segment, uh, so that being obviously property, as opposed to a horizontal, which would have multiple segments. So for example, goods, cars, all combined. Um, we do not sell or rent property directly. We create a platform for estate agents and private owners to market their properties for sale and rent. The platform currently has about 4,600 small to medium sized estate agency customers and one customer that could be considered large. All right, um, so I'm just going to pop out of this and 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 hopefully um, you know this 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 works. Um, I'm actually going to um, just pop into a browser session if you don't mind, and uh, and and just try and give a a bit of a live demo. I know it's I know it's uh, it's quite dangerous in these kinds of things, but uh, but uh, give me a give me a chance to uh, to try and let's see. The most dangerous is us seeing all your other personal emails and. Uh documents. I think you have access to all of that already. Uh, give me a minute. All right. Um, do you see my browser there? No, we're still s seeing, well. Yeah, JP, I think this is correct. We, we see your browser. All right. OK, got it. Great. So, okay, first thing that you'll notice is that my browser is in private mode. Um, and the reason it's in private mode is because Google obviously knows a lot about you. And um, and and when you're normally browsing in you know in your own browser, you're actually going to see very personalized um, results. So you can't you can't really make any assumptions out of your own personal browsing because Google's looked at your history and is giving you what, really what what you want. When you um, make it in private mode, uh, it gives a little bit more anonymity and and you get a, a kind of a, a, a better idea of what's actually happening on Google. Not 100%, but better. So the way that we see our customers engaging with um, with the real estate marketplace, and when I say I'm, I'm talking now about property buyers and renters, is that usually when someone enters the property buying or renting process, um, it's it's quite a long term pro, uh, process for them, especially buying, and normally they're not they're not necessarily aware of where to go. So they usually their first port of call is usually Google. And they usually come up with the first generic term in their minds, and this this usually is property for sale or houses for sale. So if you look at Google, you'll find that property for sale and houses for sale 
are the um, are the biggest uh, um, generic keywords uh, the, on their platform. And if you type in property for sale, uh, you get a result on Google, as we all know. And you'll see that the first few results are all ads, clearly marked by Google. Uh, Easy.com, uh, a, a state agency, Rawson, a group of state agency. Um, I'm not sure what this one is, Quinta.Cape Town. And then Property24 has come up uh, in this slot over here. And then we get to the organic results. And this time Property24 has come up um, first. Uh, private properties come up second, Pam Golding third, Remax fourth. Now, as a consumer, uh, some consumers will click on the ads. Some consumers will click on the organic. And we roughly see about a 50-50 split between these, these types of consumers clicking on ads versus organic. Uh, normally, what happens is, is someone will click on, a, on, a, on, on one of the first links, usually, and, and see what comes up. Now, you'll see that for this particular search, I searched for property for sale, uh, generic, but now I've landed in property for sale in Cape Town. So why is that? It's because you know we looked at where you were coming from. Well, in fact, we didn't. Google did. Google looked at where we were, where I was coming from, and it said, "I think that this particular page on Property Twenty Four is most relevant for you, uh, typing in a property for sale and coming from Cape Town." And so it served our property for sale in Cape Town page to the consumer. However, the consumer might not be wanting to see property in Cape Town. They might scroll down a bit and they might see, "Oh wow." This is not really relevant. There's 9,800 listings, and, and I'm actually looking for a particular area. So they might go back and they might refine their search. And usually, we do see um, we see people actually clicking on multiple sites at this stage. So, for example, you might go to a, a Remax. Remax, obviously, being a very large national brand with a lot of listings, and you get a similar type of experience. They've also page in Cape Town has also come up. You'll see 2,023 listings. Uh, and someone might look through this and say, OK, this is also not necessarily what I want. I want something more focused. And they then go back and say, look, you know, I'm actually looking for property in an area. And this is how people refine their search downwards. They usually choose an area or multiple areas to search in. So in this case, I'm going to search um, in Shoshanguve. OK, let's see. Property for sale, Shosh and Gube. So now we get a different result. Now we've got private property, which has an ad at the top. Pri property 24 has got another ad below here. And here we see Property 24, uh, Shosh and Gube, and a whole bunch else. And you'll see that there are other sites that come up. So my roof uh, in this particular area uh, is doing relatively well. RealNet is doing relatively well as well. Consumers will click on various sites. So let's click on Property 24. And they'll take a look and, and, and over time, they'll decide what is what is more relevant to them. So you'll see here, Shosh and Guve, 3,250 listings. Wow, that's a lot. Okay, now I know I want to look in Shosh and Guve, but this is way too much for me to go through. I'll, sp I'll spend weeks trying to go through this stuff. So then you start looking at the features of the site. Has it got filtering? Yes, it has. All right, so let's see. Let's look for a house and let's say my price range is I don't know, 800,000 to 900,000 Rand. Uh, and let's say I'm looking for three bedroom plus. And there are more filters that you can fill in, but let's go with these right now. And what happens is my filter cuts down to 221 properties, which is now much more relevant um, for this, this particular buyer uh, as what was shown before. I can also decide, um, you know, do I want to order this by, you know, different different ways, low to high, high to low, most recent, or I can just go through the default order as it is. Now, interestingly, you'll see in the default order that um, there's, a, you know, there's there's a listing here that has a much larger um, uh, format than the standard listings. So why is that? That is a promoted product that this estate agency has bought. So you'll see here, a standard listing has come up at the top, a promoted listing there, and then it's a mix of standard uh, going down, et cetera. And you'll also notice that um, that uh, this is a, so this is state agency, SINMAC. Um, it's not a national brand. It's clearly quite local to the area. Um, if I want to go and look at that estate agency, I can click on the listing and I can go and look at who they are. Um, do they look legit? Yes, they do. They've got a lot of good estate agents, it looks like. Um, and so I can get familiar with um, with non-national brands in, in this way. So you'll see that the non-national brands are listing and advertising on the same kind of space as what a national brand would list. 
And if we scroll down, uh, let's try and find a national brand that is playing in the same space. Um, my, there we go, Remax. So Remax listing down there, um, you know, uh, playing on the same kind of platform as a Synmac, which is a big advantage to um, to that that smaller that smaller platform. Okay, I'm going to cancel out of this now. And just go back to my presentation and we'll take off from there. Okay, uh, can any, everyone see that? We can. Great stuff. That's quite a relief um, that, uh, that the demo worked and, and all is fine. All right, so um, so there's a couple of things in that demo that that, that I just wanted to um, wanted to point out, uh, and and I have already mentioned them, but um, one is that is that consumers are using Google to discover websites. They're then going into those websites, looking at them, and trying to find relevance, and where they find good content, good user experience, good search, and relevance, they tend to start using those sites more, and they then tend to start searching for those sites. Once they start, as um, uh, I think um, um, Mr. Hruvier or Mr. Manning might have said this morning, um, once, a, once a user has become familiar with, uh, with a site that they like, then they might start searching for, for example, Property24 Soshanguve, so they can go directly to the Soshanguve page. Right, I just want to talk about some history and context to Property24. Our mission in South Africa is to create the best marketplace that consumers turn to first and engage with most. So we're very consumer focused. We've put the consumer front and center. The second is to empower agents and provide them with leads. Because that's what agents are looking for. They're looking to advertise their properties and sell them. And then to simplify and improve the South African property marketplace through innovation. We're part of the Olex group. And here we've just shown um, an organogram structure of where Olex fits within NUSPAS. And you can see that um, that we're actually under process uh, and very separate to Media24 and MIH, which is where Take A Lot sits. And Property24 and Auto Trader both fall under Olex Amir. Olex is uh, is a large company, a large multinational. It operates in 30 plus countries in emerging markets around the globe. South Africa only makes up around 2% of the Olex Group revenue, so South Africa is relatively small uh, inside the group. Property 24, just incidentally, was originally part of the Media 24 group, but has not been since 2009. And I'll go into a little bit of the history now. So in 1999, um, you would have heard this, this morning um, with Mr. Muela, uh, private property was started in 1998 and Property 24 was started in 1999. So we've both had a long journey and we've both had uh, multiple pivots um, along the way. Uh, and we have been uh, fierce competitors along the way. Um, it was started um, within the NASPAS Media 24 group, and um, it's changed ownership and focus along the way. The initial offering um, of Property 24 was really a, a, it was a combination of editorial content, which, which, which was squarely in the, in the Media 24 um, kind of um, uh, stable of, of uh, um, expertise. And then it, it, it had... Uh, some estate agent listings, but they weren't um, they weren't the focus of the site. Uh, they were they, they were kind of an add-on, uh, and and the business evolved into a JV eventually with APSA. It was a mortgage switching JV actually, where um, the business would earn commissions on um, on people switching uh, into a, into an APSA mortgage, and um, the business went on like that for a number of years until 2008, when the global financial crisis hit. Um, and uh, and and unfortunately, the you know the financials uh, were, were really not good, and um, it ended up with uh, with the JV being split, uh, and Media 24 taking back 100% of Property 24, and Absa taking um, you know the the um, the book that that we had built. Uh, post that, the business was in a bit of a crisis because it, um, it 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 didn't really know where you know where its future was from there, and it was actually sold to. 
a relatively small um, company, a software company called Corbitech, in which NASPAS then bought a 51% stake. So as part of the transaction, NASPAS bought a 51% stake and uh, property 24 was sold to Corbitech. And, um, and I'll go into it in more detail later, but, but the reason for that whole transaction was that Corbitech came up with quite an interesting uh, business model, which it wanted to try and implement in the South African market. Um, various monetization models were attempted with limited success before we implemented the current uh, lead-based um, model that, that we have today. Um, for the, from the time that it was taken over by Corbitech um, to uh, around about um, 2015, um, the business was actually given complete operational control. So uh, the Corbitech um, uh, shareholders and, and senior management um, effectively manage the strategy and the and the business plans of of the business for you know for those those five years. So they, they were quite independent, um, and uh, and it's 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 useful to note that the business was funded by Corbitech cash flows, and Corbitech had minority shareholders. Obviously, forty nine percent of it was minority shareholders. So it was quite uh, it was quite difficult in those years to actually build the business um, without. Um, having to dilute shareholders, go back and ask for more money, et cetera. We had to be very careful about the amount of money we spent on, on product development, on marketing, et cetera. So um, the DNA of this business has been, you know, do things on a very lean basis. In 2010, uh, we the, uh, sorry, later from 2010, this, the focus was shifted towards improving the content and the product and for creating more value for the estate agents. And the last part of the journey we've had is uh, is to improve the product and create um, promoted products for estate agents. Um, and we've done lots of improvements to the product um, over you know over over the years and continue to to do so. The competitive landscape. So a little brief overview of classifieds in South Africa. Um, I believe that Mr. Manning touched on this uh, this morning. But prior to 2010, the newspapers were the primary advertising platform, um, and they were organized into two, as far as I, as I understand, and I might be wrong, they were organized into two different joint ventures, uh, one in the north and one in the south. And, um, and the joint ventures were between the top um, estate agent um, groupings, or a group of estate agents, um, and the Saturday newspapers. And my understanding was that the newspapers were forced into those JVs at some stage by the industry. Um, now, what? As and again, this is this is all hearsay, and and I can't, um, I, you know, I, I can't, I can't say this is absolutely true. But, um, but from what, from my my own experience of the newspapers in those days, you would only really see the big national brands um, in advertised front and center. Uh, you know, in, in, and remember, they used to have different sections. Um, the smaller brands couldn't afford to advertise um, or to compete on, on creating brand and advertising uh, in those pages. And they were largely um, pushed to, to the back pages where you had those small little property ads. Uh, and if they could afford it, they might take one or two, you know, color ads, um, et cetera. So it wasn't a, a really good, um, uh, it wasn't really an open and and, and um, pro-competitive um, marketing platform that was available for uh, for smaller estate agents. Internet penetration then started uh, skyrocketing. So we started seeing from from around 2011, 2012, uh, internet penetration just went through the roof and it just started growing really fast. And that was because of the advent of smartphones. Uh, and, and clearly this started having a negative effect on uh, newspaper advertising as consumers moved uh, online. Uh, you know, in, in their droves. And we were particularly lucky in this business in that we um, we switched the focus to, to classifieds in 2010-11. And, um, and, and when that, when that, that uh, tailwind of, of internet consumers came, it kind of hit us from behind and, and we were just almost in the right place at the right time. At the time, um, you know, property advertising moved to online classifieds, initially served by private property, IOL, Gumtree, and, and ourselves. And, and there was quite a lot of competition between us, uh, you know, in, in, those, in those days. There still is. Um, this, uh, increased, this increased transparency and also 
has created a level, what we think of as a level playing field, allowing smaller businesses to better compete with larger ones. So you've just seen, you know, in that example in Shoshan Gouve, how a small agency can actually brand, can almost um, take over an area if they, you know, if, if, if they're strong in a certain segment um, compared to a large national brand um, at a very, very low cost compared to what the costs were uh, in print when newspapers were, were still the primary platform. Property 24 has gotten to a stage now where um, we're lucky enough that um, that we also attract casual browsing um, uh, uh, audience that actually don't have the intent to buy. So if you look at our absolute audience size, it's it's very big compared to our, our, you know, our next um, competitor and compared to the, the, the next one after that. A large portion of that audience is not um, there to actually transact to buy or sell. Um, they're there to just view uh, property, it's it's a form of content and people do a lot of browsing and just looking. Um, interestingly, um, Mr. Crevier put up the chart of Zillow uh, and Zillow's massive growth. And and similarly with Zillow, the reason why it grew like that was because they introduced something called the Zestimate and they marketed it and, uh, and you know, huge amounts of uh, numbers of, of people who owned homes in the US uh, wanted to see what their home was worth. Not They didn't want to buy or sell, they just wanted to see what their Zestimate was. And that drove all of that traffic onto Zillow um, in the US uh, in, 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 in the beginning, which was quite a good content strategy. Uh, our vertical classifiers model is characterized by um, a two-sided market um, with network effects. Um, it's indirect network effects. On the one side of the market, we've got property buyers or tenants um, who are looking for homes and the service is obviously free for them. Um, on the other side, we have a, a much smaller number of players, and these are the estate agent businesses that pay to list their properties. The, um, the network effects reinforce competitive constraints and ex they exclude the possibility of, of, of monopolization or exclusion um, and exercise of market power because, um, because they, they require both sides of the network to work. So if we, if we mess up one side, then the other side will go away. So, for example, if we do a bad job with innovation, with uh, user experience, with search, um, customers very quickly will move to where they can find a better experience with potentially other listings. If we lose an estate agent customer, their listings go away, but their listings can still be found on other platforms. And so those consumers will quickly realize I'm not seeing the full market and they will leave. And you can very easily decline into a negative network effect with this kind of um, with this kind of model. It's certainly not um, an, an extremely strong um, network effect that we see here. And there are examples that um, that support this. I mean, we've seen Gumtree in our local market have, uh, you know, an extremely what we thought was an extremely strong network effect uh, many years ago. Um, and it was massive, massive platform, and it slowly declined um, over time because they haven't really invested in um, in that business at all. We've seen Craigslist in the US also decline similarly uh, because they haven't changed with the times, et cetera. So these things are not insurmountable. We, we therefore have to continuously be providing the best possible platform to create value for both sets of our customers, and that keeps us on our toes. The landscape has evolved dramatically in t over ten years. So you know, uh, this is a this is a graph, and it's it's taken from uh, the Google Trends tool, which is amazing. It, if you put in a, a a term, it'll show you the number of searches uh, for that term relative to other terms. So in in this particular one, I've put in Gumtree, which is the green bar, and I've put in private property, which is the red one. I've put in property twenty four and OLX, and you can see that around 2010, how massive Gumtree was, um, how how uh, how much brand equity they had, how many people were searching for Gumtree, it, it was just huge. And since then, you know how that has declined over time. And I would venture, I don't know what their numbers are like, but I would venture to say that their traffic has mirrored this almost exactly. Their traffic has declined, you know, substantially. And this is a good example, as I was saying earlier, of um, of someone being disrupted because they haven't invested in. Um, you know, in, in one side of, uh, of, their, of their network. Uh, 
if you look at um, at property 24 and private property, if you go back to around 2010 there, you'll see, and, and we can pull out the, the real numbers, but you can see that property 24 was about half the size of private property at that stage. And, um, and, and there you can just see a comparison on the right-hand side, those bars, just compare the situation from uh, 2010 to to date, where the position has effectively flipped. Back then, they were 67%, uh, and today, you know, they're the other side. Um, and it just shows you, you know, how things can change um, over a number of years, um, given a, a, a particular strategy or change um, change in product, etc. You can see that through 2000, and, uh, you know, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, um, over a number of years, um, we we passed private property um, in terms of those searches, and you can see that we've grown well uh, since then. And property 24, uh, sorry, private property has been relatively flat over that uh, over that same period. Um, IOL property, unfortunately, I haven't got on this chart, but IOL property was very small at the moment, and um, and they were at that stage also one of the contenders, but they just didn't invest at all um, along with you know with with everyone else they, they just fell by the wayside because there was just simply no investment in product marketing um, I don't know what what happened there the primary reason for property 24's growth over our competitors is that we focus on creating the best possible experience for our users we need to work hard for us to stay relevant and this involves four of our core areas one is we strive to have all the properties on our platform. Now, um, we know that we don't have all the properties on our platform, but we want to have as many as possible. It's actually, I think, impossible to have them all unless you're a scraper like an aggregator, um, which do have them all. The broadness, broadness of selection of properties is crucial uh, to engage users. They want to see everything in the, in, you know, in the market. Um, quality is, is, is the next one. So for us, you know, we need to ensure a high quality experience. That means pictures, descriptions, information. Uh, it's, 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 the user wants to know what the size of the apartment is or the house is and the size of the earth and what the rates were, et cetera. So we try and give that to them. The third one is, is experience, and, and that's largely the search experience, but it goes to the, the total user experience um, of the platform in every step of their journey. So that talks to search filtering, site speed, ease of use, um, you know, uh, and, and that all contributes to getting that user back to use your site every time. And the last one is trust. Uh, you have to create trust in your platform, a trusted brand, um, because um, consumers um, consumers want to go to a trusted marketplace when they're going to interact with um, with estate agents. They don't want to be uh, defrauded, and, and there are cases of fraud that uh, that do happen. This is also quite an interesting chart. These come from a platform called SimilarWeb which is um, sample based data and it's the only way that we can really compare ourselves to our competitors um, in the market it's, it's widely used on the internet as a tool and if we look at um, at private property and property 24 on similar web um, it's quite interesting because if you split these charts by new users and returning users you can see that on a monthly basis private property and p24 almost get around the same number of new users so people are coming and trying us both. However, um, the returning users are much higher on Property24. And that just shows that Property24 is giving users the experience that they want to have. And you know, private property, for some reason, is not. Just want to talk a bit about the products that we offer to our state agent customers. Um, the first core product that we offer is our standard for sale listing subscription, um, and this product is is based on a on a matrix. Uh, it's quite logical. What the matrix says is that um, if you start in the top left, anything less than you, you can list as many properties as you like on property 24. We do not restrict the number of properties you list. If we provide you with 10 leads, which is uh, defined as leads in our in our um, in our contract, clearly defined, and your median property is less than 1.3 million, then we will charge you um, 463 rand a month. And as you can move to higher value properties, the price goes up. So if you move to the right, it goes to 480 rand, to 500 rand, to 528 rand. 
right, if your listing property is greater than 7 million rand and you're getting less than 10 leads, then we're charging you 557 rand. And then as you go up in the lead brackets, the prices then continue to go up. So um, it's done by lead volume. And I just want to make sure that everyone understands that because um, uh, I can't recall, I think it might have been Mr. Manning, who was under the impression that Property24 charged by clicks, by views, and that's not the case at all. In fact, Mr. Manning's listings were rental listings, and rental listings uh, we charge on a, on a number of listings basis. We don't charge for clicks or views or leads at all for rental listings. So I think there's just a misunderstanding there, and, and we'll try and clear that up with him. So um, the nice thing with this model is that um, this model is very open to new entrants in the market because um, if you if you want to start out as a new estate agent, there's no risk in this model for you. You can list 10 properties and see what kind of leads you get. If you get zero leads, there's zero cost. You know, you could also count and say, yes, but I don't know how many leads I'm going to get. You might just charge me a fortune because I get a thousand leads. But that's really nonsense because leads really equate to the number of listings you have. If you look at the average on the platform, there's a number of leads that we generate per, per listing that you have, and you're never going to get um, you know, uh, uh, radically outside of that, that range. But if you were worried about that, you could just list one property and see how it went, and it would cost you very, very little. We, because of this, um, of this matrix stru structure that we have, um, we believe that, that on a cost per lead basis, on average, we are the lowest price in the market. And we look at our competitors and we try and figure out what it would be on a cost, a cost per lead basis. And every time we do look at them, we find that, um, that we offer more value uh, than what our competitors do. On a rental listing basis, we, we have these different um, uh, segments. So if you, for one to 10 rental listings, we charge 233 Rand, 11 to 20, 433, et cetera. And so you simply charge per listing that you put onto the portal. And you might ask, why is this so different from the for sale, um, the for sale pricing? And the reason is actually quite simple, is that on the for sale side, it's, it's, it's a different kind of market. And we're trying to incentivize the state agents to list all of their products on the portal. Whereas on the rental side, you've actually got to try and disincentivize the estate agent to list because often um, people, because rental is much more liquid and it comes on and goes off much more often um, and, and there's slightly less value in rental, um, often uh, people are lax when it comes to removing rentals from the platform and then you end up with stale stock that people don't remove. The next product is our branded listing product where you can add your branding to a tile so if you don't have branded listings, then the little your, that little square branding uh, is not on there. However, when you click on the listing, you can clearly see the estate agent. It's not like uh, Mr. Manning was saying where, uh, you know, there's a blank page. It's not. Your picture as an estate agent is there, and your name as an estate agent is certainly there. So you absolutely do know who you're dealing with. Um, and um, we have this on a on a also on a sliding scale. So the less the less listings you have, the cheaper it is, and the more listings you have, obviously, the more expensive it's going to be. To be fair, also if you're in a high interest area, uh, it's more expensive, and if you're in a standard interest area, it's cheaper. Then we have our promoted listings products, and um, the first one is we call the premium listing. And this goes, this is one position that goes to the top of each page. So each page has one position allowed for premium listings. Um, the estate agent buys this, can buy this for seven days at a time, and they range from between 117 Rand to 473 Rand, um, you know, depending on the area that you're in. So in a cheaper area, the price will be a lot lower. Uh, if there are, say you have um, in an area uh, 10 pages of listings, and you have three people that have taken premium listings, um, they will rotate randomly amongst the three pages. So sometimes one will display at the first page, sometimes another one will display on the first, th uh, first page, et cetera. And that's to be fair to distribute the position amongst them fairly. The next product is featured listings. Um, with this product, this allows you to, to change the format of your listing. You'll see the format is different there. It has um, a large, a uh, picture in the middle, then three pictures on the side, and your branding goes to the top of the listing. So the format changes from standard. 
and it goes to the top of um, the listing ranking. Obviously, you have to have your quality score. It can't just be you know a bad listing. It's got to be a decent listing. So your quality score has to be above a certain amount to to buy this. Um, if um, if I'm the first one buying this, then I will move. To, I'll clearly be you know at the top of the page. If um, a competitor um, buys one after me, then they will pop into the top, and I will be moved one position down, and so on and so on. Uh, and we find that this um, this product has actually been very popular, um, and it's been sold broadly across um, across our base, um, but um, but not as broadly as we would we would like. The last one is um, is boosted listings, and what this does is it allows you to um, you can see you get an additional two images on the bottom of your um, of your tile. The tile is bigger, uh, the branding goes across the top of the page, and uh, as an estate agent you'll get your photo. Uh, put onto it as well. Um, this is bought for a 30-day period, so it's um, between 237 rand and 592 rand for a single listing for a month, um, and um, uh, and it 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 lifts your it it basically adds a small amount to your quality score, so that you are lifted in the rankings slightly, but. It's impossible for us to tell you exactly how much because it's relative to other people's and other agents' um, quality scores and where you are. If you're on page five, you know, it, it, who knows, it might move you to page four, but it'll never move you to page one. But there are different instances of it, and, and it, 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 it's, not, um, it, it's not a product that moves you to the top of the page. Then we have agency websites, and... Um, uh, you heard earlier as well that uh, all estate agents want um, want a website. Uh, many estate agents spend a lot of money on their websites um, with uh, with other service providers. We we provide a quite a basic and cheap product. It's 674 rand a month, and you get a Mobi site and a website that has um, you know reasonable functionality. It doesn't have the best functionality out there, but it has for the price, it's very good value. Uh, on the right-hand side of the search results, we also have um, an estate agent banner ad, um, which uh, an estate agent can buy, and up to three estate agents can buy in that area. So um, if there are three estate agents in that area, it's rotated amongst the three of them. Uh, and these are priced per area as well, and they are relatively cheap. Um, so it's a nice product for an agent who wants to brand themselves uh, in a particular area. Some of the main points um, in terms of our commercial strategy. Um, so property 24 determines pricing based on value de delivery. We look at how much value we're providing to our customers and we determine our pricing as such. The volume based pricing maximizes the consumer experience, experience by incentivizing agents to list all their listings. Uh, that is why we don't want to restrict agents by a number of listings. We want them to put everything on there because consumers want to see as much as possible. The promoted listings are non-rivalrous and are not prohibitively expensive. So when you look at the cost of these promoted listings, and in fact the cost of listing on Property24, um, and when you compare that to the commissions earned in an estate agency, it really is very, very, very small. And you can do that calculation on a number of levels. You can do it on a macro level, you can do it on an office level, et cetera, but it, it's small. Estate agents earn an estimate um, 4 to 5% commission. Some earn more on the lower levels. And, and uh, so if, you, if you're selling a, a very cheap property, you're going to charge more than 5% on it. Um, and a very expensive property, you might charge less than, than that. But generally, that's the accepted range. And so um, they're achieving about a 40 to 50,000 rand commission on a home of, of about a million rand. The average, um, I've just looked at the stats earlier, the average property price at the moment is sitting at about um, 1.3, I think it's about 1.360 um, at, at the moment. So that would be lower than the average property sell, sell uh, um, at the moment. Property 24 listings cost represents, uh, sorry, not, not just the listing cost, but the listing plus promoted listings, all the expenses that estate agents spend with us on the portal, they only represent about 1.5% of earned commissions. We're arguably a low cost marketing channel for estate agents. If prices, if we did increase our prices and it was unrelated to value, we would very quickly lose our customers. 
we'd lose our listings and in turn it would create a negative network effect and i think that the people that you've had on um this morning have confirmed that you know and and i think yesterday um have confirmed that um agents are not all on our platform um some of them do leave uh, the the gentleman this morning um was only on private property and yet he has you know he has a sustainable business uh, strategic considerations um so property 24 has no exclusivity or control over content uh, we have a little bit of a different view of listings than private property obviously we have different views of of the world um, when we look at our listing our source of listings 41 percent of them are internal i.e they come from our prop control platform 24 percent of them come from prop data which is the third party platform that uh, we we're talking about um, you know earlier and then you can see how it declines into other integral who uh, mr crevier was on this morning um, fusion which is private properties um, webbox which is another one um, and then other estate agent platforms that, that they own themselves um, looking at the source of listings you can see clearly here the majority of listings actually come from external systems not from prop control um, we do not prevent third parties from using listing software of their choice we obviously prefer them to use prop control but it doesn't stop them from do using anything else some are independent and some are proprietary to agency groups so for example um, a group like um, the pam golding group uh, has internal systems that are proprietary to pam golding and require integration with their system we find that uh, this software um, listing software uh, switching happens often and continuously so we've had we, we we continuously we have a whole department called operations that deals with customers who are switching service providers whether it be from us to someone else or from someone else to an independent or back again and we've had many many instances where um uh, where state agents have switched between platforms and back again over the years and and kind of try different ones out um, it creates a lot of cost in our in our business Estate agents use multiple platforms um, uh, to show the, the uh, listings on 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 P24. Um, so uh, you find um, that estate agents can actually use that. So because the costs of 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 listing on property 24 are actually so low, um, it's it we actually find estate agents spending money on other platforms and other listing software. So for example, an estate agent might happily use prop control but use another platform that they pay for to feed elsewhere um, and and they'll just cover that cover that that cost a lot of times we've found that estate agents spend more on their listing software and websites than they spend on property 24 in fact and competitors for that matter estate agents some um, multi-home uh, between uh, across across multiple platforms mainly because it is so cheap for them to do so the cost the incremental cost of listing on another platform versus the commission on one sale is just so asynchronous that it's just it's just worthwhile for agents to list uh, in as many places as 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 they can which to to make it convenient we believe and we we're very proud of our platform um we believe that it improves the marketplace um it it has uh, it creates low barriers to entry for estate agents um we also think that entry into our market is actually low low has a low entry barrier and um and i think that the gentleman from property central you know um although he, he he's complaining that you know they can't get traction um it just shows that in a year and a half um, a very small individual player can come into the market, launch a property platform, start acquiring listings, and actually, if you want to start spending some marketing money. So the barriers to entry um, are, are, are relatively low. Agents are multi-homing, and there's software that's inter, uh, 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 third-party software that interoperates with the various um, platforms. Um, property Central, as we saw, was just added to um, uh, Integral. Uh, and uh, and, I, and I think that private property was was going to look at adding them. And um, there's another important point here, and that is that the incumbents actually pave a way in a way for new entrants into the market because of 
the amount of work that we've done on quality scores and moderation. So the reason for quality scores um, on our site was to improve the quality, because when we started, we would find agents putting watermarks on the listings, putting their photos on, putting their number across the listing, bad photographs, um, lack of information, etc. And so we've incentivized estate agents to improve their listings. And if they improve their listings, they get a better score and their, their listing falls down slower in the process. In other words, they, they get more exposure. Now, um, because we've done that, what happens is um, those listings, those improved quality listings become available to the whole market. So um, the gentleman from Property, uh, Property Central, if he, for example, had a feed integrated from uh, Prop Data, he would find that the estate agent feeding to him would not be capturing a separate listing to go to his site. They would simply be sending the same listing that they send to Property24 and Private Property and whoever else, they'll be sending it to Property Central. And Property Central immediately, without any moderation team, with no uh, tech invested in, in quality score, et cetera, gets the benefit of a high quality listing that we have uh, at pains over the years created. Um, we believe that the platform levels the playing field for the estate agent industry. It allows new entrants into the market, it allows smaller brands to compete, to compete alongside um, the older, more established brands. There is an aggregated threat uh, in our market. So we've seen in other categories like, um, for example, the jobs category in the US, where aggregators, ag by aggregators I mean um, international sites that come to your market and scrape all the content from um, uh, from all from wherever they can get it, the estate agent sites, the portal sites, um, wherever. And they then start competing with local players um, to charge estate agents for, um, for cost per lead. Now, if you look at the case of Indeed in jobs in, in the US, um, that aggregator was so successful that they actually became the de facto uh, jobs leader in that market. Um, over a period of time. And then um, what um, uh, Mr. Muela has already spoken to uh, from private property uh, is the Facebook disruption. We do face a real threat from Facebook. Uh, in developing markets, Facebook leverages its user base to offer solutions to estate agents. Um, we can see that at the moment, the user experience on Facebook marketplace for, for, uh, for property is not, is not great. However, if you look at the developed markets, it's different. They're starting to put a lot of effort into those markets. So look at the UK, um, Australia, the US, et cetera. Those improvements in the Facebook marketplace product will come to our market. There's no doubt that they'll, it'll come to our market. Estate agents are already using Facebook to generate leads. We already know that, um, that uh, Facebook is attracting competitive spend. It is simply a matter of time before estate agent listings end up on the Facebook platform, because the listings will go where there is value. Just to sum up um, and to end our presentation, um, we support SMEs and HDPs. Property 24's customers are SMEs. We don't contract with a Remax who is the owner of the franchise. We contract with the franchisee who's the little office on the corner who owns a Remax brand and who's the business owner of that franchise. Those are customers, you know, barring one. Uh, Property24 in the last year has identified 50 HDPs to participate in our enterprise development program, and we've given the commission the information on those. Our intention is obviously to expand that over time and to do more. Uh, we're currently on level seven B, B, BBE score, and we're aiming to improve that and achieve a level six uh, in 2022. And with that, um, I'd like to thank uh, the Commission and uh, and anyone who's in the public uh, listening to us for your time. Uh, and, uh, and I'll end my presentation and hand back to uh, to the Commission. Thank you very much, Mr. Farina. Maybe you can stop sharing your screen and then we'll see you more prominently. Apologies. Sorry, Mr. Friedrich, can I just, I, I think I missed it, but when did you join 
Property 24. It was post Corbitex acquisition, is that right? Um, it was 2011. Uh, however, I actually started working with Corbitech um, late 2010. All right, and you came in as the CEO, or no? I, I came in as um, as G general manager, um, Property 24. Uh, Corbitech at that stage was a software a software company. It had it had a variety of it actually had software that catered for convincing attorneys to trans uh, to to transfer property, and that was the property angle. Um, and uh, and it had an interesting business model that it uh, it it, uh, it pitched. Um, and uh, and and we we try to implement. All right. Um, so I just wanted to locate your history in this, and then then the I got up to 2015. There was complete operational control, and and after 2015, um, you ma um, mentioned so that. So I was just wondering. Yes. Then um, and Naspas acquired a. Um, 85% took its stake up to 85%, and um, and uh, look, we we actually in our in our shareholder agreement we actually had um, we had operational control as as a as as one of the um, conditions of our shareholder agreement. So um, after five years that ended, and and then we just became uh, you know a, a, another entity, independent entity within the Nasdaq nice stable. All right. So so when you say we, that's Corbitech. Um, at that point, sorry. All right, Correct. so after, after this period up to 2015, we sort of jumped to, um, after scaling the basic business model in the late 2010s, focus shift to improving content. I mean, can you just talk us through the, the scaling process? Um, yeah, so do you, do, you want me to, do you want me to start with kind of 2010? Or later, I'm not sure where. I'm I'm happy with 2010 if you want to. Um, I just want to understand the phases the business went through, and and sorry, I should. I mean, history is really confidential, but also just remind you. Obviously, don't traverse confidential information. Yes, no, I got. I do understand. I'll, I'll try. Um, all right. So when um, uh, when we started, um, we had a very ambitious business plan that, um, and when I look at it now, it was extremely naive, um, but we wanted to um, digitize the property transaction. So we had this idea that, um, that you know, there were so many touch points in the property transaction and consumers were going offline and online and uh, there were pieces of paper being passed between different parties in this whole transaction, that if we could create a platform that digitized most of this, um, we could create value. And so, um, and and hence the the Corbitech angle, and we created a a model, and 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 also, uh, sorry, in addition to this, the context of this was that um, we had this competitor private property that um, was really very very good um, at the time. I mean, they were the team that they had. Um, they were funded by Tiger Global Management, which I'm sure you know is the big U.S. hedge fund. Uh, who's a big tech investor, and um, and through that through that funding and relationship, they had access to um, companies like Edilista in Spain, etc. And they were smart, and um, and they were years ahead of us, I think. So um, at the time in the market, they were double this our size. Um, they had a better platform. They had a better user experience. They already had implemented a quality score. Um, they, they were really, um, yeah, they, they, they were really far ahead of us, and um, and they were charging estate agents, um, if I remember correctly, something in the region of, uh, at the time, 55 rand per listing, and uh, and they were slowly signing up the estate agents um, onto the the total estate agents onto the platform. They had a lot of estate agents, but the estate agents weren't listing all their properties because it was so expensive. Um, you know, you can't list all your properties of, uh, at that stage when there was no value, very little value at that kind of pricing at that time. I mean, today that would be, I don't know, I'd, I'd, I'd do the calculation, but it would be crazy prices today. Anyway, so, um, so we looked at the situation and we thought, okay, 
we are the small the small player here. We've got to think differently. Um, how do we disrupt um, you know, private property? How, how do we start competing? IOL property at the time was competing on just the complete standard uh, monthly, flat monthly fee. Um, Gumtree was not focusing really on the business consumer. They weren't giving the estate agent much. Um, uh, so they were big, but, um, but the experience wasn't good. And so we saw a gap. And we thought we can disrupt, uh, you know, we can disrupt private property here uh, if we if we're fast enough. And um, and what we did is um, is we created a model um, which was based on this digitization of the platform. And the model went like this: we said um, we went to uh, uh, the estate agents, we went to each each group of estate agents, and we pitched to them, and um, we said, look, um, we would like to implement a model where you join our platform. And you pay us only a success-based fee when you sell a property, and the success-based fee will be very low. It'll it'll be I, I don't recall the actual amount, but it was a, a you know a fee that you paid when you sold a property. Um, and um, and then um, and then we said, but if you partner with us to try and digitize this platform, then what we will do is we will build a, um, a, a systems and and platforms for all the players in the industry to be able to instruct each other electronically. Um, and we can charge for value created there because, for example, the conveyancing attorney gets an email from the estate agent. They then have to do a deeds office search, which costs them money. Um, they have to imp imp implement or uh, capture and implement all the necessary information. So there's cost in, there's cost and time in that. We could um, automate that, um, plug the property into the um, conveyancing attorney's software, um, have it already verified and popped up there as an instruction. And we would then be able to charge the conveyancing attorney for the convenience of having access to that. Likewise, with a beetle certificate, um, water, electrical, um, and I think that if I remember correctly, we had seven seven different uh, um, digitization um, items that we intended to to try and and, and make work. And um, and and that was this JV called Riasa that we went into with. Um, with a group of with the national uh, estate agents. Now, we started implementing that um, that strategy, and we started building software. We started trying to improve our site, um, and we went a, a long way down the road of cr building these platforms. What we found, however, in the meantime, um, the estate agents started listing their properties with us. And it just incidentally, I don't recall who it was earlier that said. It might have been private property that said that listings were exclusive on property 24. And I just want to put on record that that is absolute nonsense. We have never, ever, ever asked for exclusivity from anyone in this market. In fact, when we launched that model, part of I rem, I've even got it on our slide on our presentations. Part of the presentation was list Mr. Farina, everywhere. I don't think they made that claim. I just think they said they lost um, listings. That's all. I think someone, anyway, someone I, I got my hair up because because it, it, it's such a sensitive subject, you know. And someone did say that um, uh, it was exclusive. Anyway, um, private property. I know Mr. Mueller wasn't there at the time, and so he doesn't have the benefit um, of, of 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 firsthand knowledge. But um, private property did not lose listings at the time. Um, we were measuring closely, you know, the listings on ourselves and private property, and we can pull that out of our history, um, you know, and show that. And so I'm not sure where the narrative has come in where, you know, suddenly private property lost listings. It wasn't like that at all. Um, but what happened was that we did gain listings uh, because the state agents saw value because they thought, oh, OK, this is great. We can list all of our listings and it's risk free. I, I'm only going to pay um, if if um, if I sell something. And to a large extent, a large gain in the listings came from the small estate agents and the long tail of estate agents. Because you know it 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 was cheap for them, um, and uh, and risk free, so it was quite a um, it was a it, it was quite a the whole thing was 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 a, was a clever strategy, but it didn't work. It was it was just far too we were far too clever for our own good, and um, it fell apart because um, we could never um, get the estate agents to do what we needed them to do. So in other words, what, what we needed was we needed the estate agent in an office 
to instruct the attorney electronically when they did when they had an OTP to create an electronic OTP, etc. And we just never carried enough influence to get that to happen. And our state agent partners, what we realized uh, at the time was that our state agent partners also didn't actually have the influence because the way that the industry is structured is that you have these national estate agent brands that don't own the businesses. They're a franchise. So they don't own the businesses. They, they might own some businesses, but what they do is they provide um, expertise. They might provide a platform and brand, et cetera, but they do not own the business on the ground. And that's a big lesson, you know, that that, that we learned, um, you know, at the time. And unfortunately, we realized that the business model just would simply would not work um, if we had to carry on with it. And it was a very tough decision uh, at the time to break because we knew that we would, um, you know, we would ruffle feathers um, with our uh, state agent partners. But we believed strongly that to um, to create a sustainable business, we would have to go it on our own. And um, without the, the digitization uh, model, we'd have to go into a pure classified um, business model. And so we pivoted the, the business into a classified model and we um, we started charging, um, uh, I think it was a, we charged a single fee, but we would discount that fee if you didn't receive a certain number of leads. So we had a lead guarantee model that we put in place. Uh, where it was just a, a, a relatively, it was, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't cheap. It was, it was, I think it was one and a half thousand rand or 1,000, I think it was 1,295 rand, if I'm not correct. Um, but we would only charge you, I think, half of that if we didn't achieve the leads that we promised. Um, so there was a, a, a flaw, you know, on, on those leads. And we then proceeded to go out to the market and sign up all of the individual um, franchise uh, uh, owners, uh, um, uh, franchisees, um, and independent um, estate agents and small agents, and sign them up onto this kind of fixed fee model. Um, now, just a, a note on that is that another interesting note on that is that prior to prior to the the the, the kind of the Riasa business model that we that we tried, we were charging a flat fee of 600 rand a month to estate agents to list. And um, and at that time, um, I mean, our leads were probably a twentieth or less of what they are today. So a state is willing to pay six hundred rand a month for very very little value at the time. Um, and we also realised um, once we had implemented this kind of hybrid flat fee that a flat fee in the market doesn't work very well because um, because the market follows a power curve. In other words, you have a small number of estate agent offices that are relatively, relatively big. They're, they're all they're all kind of SME. They all fall into the SME range. But you know, if you look at the bigger offices, there's a small number that are relatively big, and then it drops off really, really quickly into kind of this middle, middle level, and then it goes into this long tail of of small agencies. And when you have a flat fee in a market like this, you disadvantage the small players hugely and you give a big advantage to the bigger players. Why do I say that? Because you've set your price at 600 Rand a month, but the small guy is, is, is not getting much value for the 600 and the large guy is getting huge amounts of value for the 600. And, um, and so we, we realized that and we thought, okay, we have to implement a model that actually reflects value that we're providing to our customers and allows uh, the smaller agencies to work so that it doesn't become expensive when you're entering, if you're at the bottom end for the long tail and you're, and you're at the bottom end. And that's when we implemented, we started implementing our lead segmentation and splitting up um, lead segments. And, and actually a large part of what we've done is actually not um, increased prices at the bottom, it's actually increased prices at the top is what's, what's actually happened in our model um, largely. Um, by the time we you know, we got through that um, the signing of the of the um, the of our customers with the new contracts. Um, I think that we we then felt that we were in maybe it was a little bit prior to that, but when when we had enough listings, we felt that we were in a good enough position. It, it was a combination of getting enough listings and rebuilding the platform 
to a state that was at least comparable with private property, but it still was not good enough in my view. We were still about two years behind, but still we had a platform that, you know, that we thought is okay and we had enough listings. And then we started spending a little bit of money on marketing and we started um, uh, testing out our engagement and seeing, you know, is it worth it? Are we getting value for our marketing? And we slowly ramped up that marketing spend until we thought we had uh, a decent um, user experience. And then we spent a little bit of money on, on, you know, on, on a television campaign, which was novel at the time, uh, and started our brand building. Um, you know, television doesn't bring users to your site at all. You don't see a jump in users on your site when you launch a television ad. But what it does is it gives a lot of brand um, equity and trust. It builds it builds your brand over over a long period of time. Um, and so we started building our marketing efforts over over years um, and and getting to a sustainable marketing spend, which we have today. And I suppose that's how we scaled the the, 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 the business is, you know, as we did that, we increased our fees um, as we saw that um, that, you know, we were leaving a huge amounts of value um, because we started off at such a I mean, if you remember, if you, if you look at the same period, you know, if you look at the lead growth that was created, it was massive. And so your pricing growth had to follow that as well. And that's effectively, I think, how how we scaled it. Thanks, Mr. Verena. And um, um, yeah, thanks for all that detail. I obviously asked for it, but I think if we're going to make progress today, we can keep the answers a little shorter. Uh, um, so as I understand, Nuspers came in with an 85% and um, you had enough listings, you'd pivoted to lead based and then you scaled. Um, and as I understand, the point of scaling is almost to lower your unit costs in a sense. You know, you get volume, um, your costs are not necessarily going to increase at the same rate. And, and that's how you get efficiencies out of a business like this. Yeah, I mean, uh, look, there's scaling is, I don't want to take too much time answering this, but scaling is multifaceted. I mean, you've got scale of platform, you've got scale of business, you know, scale of, I don't know, which scaling do, do you mean? Well, that's, I'm just asking, I mean, you're scaling, I assume your number of listings, your estate agents that are on, um, your traffic, and you're hoping to, to be, by being bigger, you've got more efficiencies, I assume. Um, and you've got a yeah. bigger customer base and you can, whereas you may have made a loss before, you can now turn a profit. Well, you know, at the time, you, you, you when you're doing it, you hope for that. At the time, it's it's always unclear. Um, you know, when you're in the midst of building a business, um, you hope that you will get to a stage where you can turn a profit and recover the investment that has been made you know, into that business uh, to, to date. Yeah, sorry, and I'm just, um, uh, you know, I, I know we can't go to confidential documents, but I'm just trying to get a sense that, uh, you know, in scaling these sort of businesses, I suppose you're putting a lot of investment up front in marketing and maybe technology, um, but you reach a sort of, I suppose, a plateau um, maybe, and that's when things can turn around to a profit in terms of your cost base. Um, no, not necessarily. I think that when you look at when we started, uh, I mean, uh, we had to, we started with 10 employees, you know, um, so we didn't start with a big investment up front, not at all. We spent, I think, a year just, just trying to, you know, uh, hold on to the estate agents that we had um, and, 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 the, and the, the little revenue that, that we had. We struggled for the first few years. Um, then, um, you know, we, we built this digitization platform, which, which did cost us a lot of money, but we didn't have a lot of money. Um, Corby Tech was, was barely paying, paying the, the, the investment. Uh, you know, we, we were barely using what, what Corby Tech was making. Um, and so it was, a, it, was quite, it was quite a struggle in the beginning. And, um, and so, no, there was no kind of massive investment up front and, and then, you know, suddenly pulling back uh, once you scaled. No. And, and from it was 2015? Was there more investment coming? Because now I suppose you've got a change of ownership. 
We had no, we've, we've never drawn down, we've never had any funding from NASPAS. Um, when I say that, I mean uh, from the Corby Tech point, because NASPAS owned property trim for 100% before that and invested money in, in property trim for before that. But in the classifieds phase, no. All right. So, so you've never drawn down loans after 2015? No, not, not before that either. All right. Um, Maybe if, if I can add one point on this topic of investments and capital. Certainly, Mr. I think uh, having, having been responsible for, for various of our classified um, entities and, and experiments in South Africa, I think the point that you're posing here of the relevance of capital and investments is, of course, well taken in today's global uh, marketplace dynamic. If you look at the entities that we're talking about here, Property24 and Tomorrow Auto Trader, a large part of their scaling, of course, happened way before NASPERS got involved. NASPERS, us, we got involved late in the process. And indeed, we never uh, invested heavily into these businesses. There are other businesses that we've attempted at launching in South Africa. Um, there, we have invested relative, on a relative basis deeper. Um, our Lex, our horizontal platform, comes to mind. Um, at a certain point in time, we launched Let Go. A unfortunately failed attempt. These um, experiments and these companies had higher investment levels and yet were unable to, to turn to a point of, let's say, relevance or healthy platforms. So, despite your fundamental point on, on capital being very relevant, um, in the South African context, that, that capital um, uh, argument hasn't played a big role for Autotrader and Pol24. And where it did, it didn't lead to success. No, thank you very much, Mr. Nicolini. I just wanted to find out. So, I mean, from what I understand, you're saying there that this was slightly different. Correct. I just wanted to to um, go back to Mr. Farina. You you wanted to correct Mr. Manning on clicks. So tell us how you do measure leads. Yeah, so um, I'm just going to refer to my our, our contract our contract here. So um, in the contract that you signed with us, we give you the we, we we're transparent with the pricing, so all the prices are there. And um, and then what we do is we say here uh, portal leads means any of the following actions by general users of the portal in relation to their inquiry into property details listed on the portal. And then we have bullet points. Users provi user provides contact details to be sent, in brackets, email slash SMS to agent. User requests click to see the agent's telephone number. Now, I think that that is what Mr. Manning is referring to, is that when a user goes onto a listing and wants to contact the estate agent, there's either, they've got two ways of doing it at the moment, in fact, well, three ways of doing it, but at the moment, let's just talk the two. Um, Effectively, they open up, they can either type in a message in, a, in a, a form on the side and press send, and then that message will be emailed and SMS to the agent, and that's a hard lead where we, we absolutely know, this, you know the person's put in their details, etc. So that's an easy one. Um, and then there's, there's, uh, there's one where the person prefers to call the estate agent, and what we have there is we have a, a telephone reveal, and a, and a, and which also reveals a WhatsApp um, conversation. So the, when the user clicks on that, we record it. And then we deduplicate those leads at the end of the day. So that, and we do a lot of work on those, on those, on those clicks so that, um, so that you know, we can weed out any spam or any other stage of clicking on someone else, you know, all the nonsense that can happen in these things. We deduplicate, clean it up, and that's what our, our fees are based on. Um, what Mr. Manning was alluding to was a view, like a click on 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 their on a viewing their property, which is not correct. And are those the only two ways that you measure a lead? Yes, I mean we had a third one, which used to be um, the email address, but we removed that. Um, I think in the course of this year we removed it because exposing the agent's email address was causing too much spam to be sent to those agents. All right, so so until earlier this year, there was a third, which is a reveal of an email address, and you say that resulted in spam. So what presumably people are going 
clicking through and then collecting email addresses in order to yeah, I mean, we've got we we do have protection against that on our site. To uh, we you know we we have various mechanisms that stop that happening, but where you find um, it's manually happening, where someone is is doing it uh, manually, it's very hard to to stop. So so we eventually decided that it's it's just not worth the hassle. Let's just take it out. And if there's, I'm assuming direct marketers doing that. Um, would there not be a possibility that they're also doing the same with the telephone number? Uh, look, there's always the possibility, but as I say, we have a technology that looks at this very specifically because because it's a it's an issue in our business, and we we monitor it very carefully. So um, so we look at where 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 these clicks come from. If they are natural, if they aren't, we've got all sorts of mechanisms um, and we can go into that in more detail i think in the in-camera sessions if you want to see the technology and what we do to inhibit spam and to stop it and remove it if it's ever found and when agents do contact us and some agents have and said listen um, i've got whatever a number of clicks that happened here uh, uh, look at my stats they went from here up to here something's gone wrong we investigate that we remove those from any billing so yes well, we'll pick that up in, in camera. Um, and so, just so I understand your power curve, I mean, if I had to look at your sort of, I suppose, categories, where would the majority of people lie? The Let's say the middle of the curve. Um, well, I've got it. In, let me just try and see if I've got that in front of me. Um, So if you look at our customer segmentation, which I think we've sent you, sent the commission, um, it's spread out at the lower, you know, at the lower end to middle end and very, very little at the top end, which is the, which is the power curve effectively. So when you look at, you know, our, uh, our top segments greater than 7 million, we have hardly any customers in those top segments. Um, you know, when you look at the more than 1,000 to 1,500 leads, also there's hardly any customers in those segments. So, you know, so that's very, very small. And then as you get closer to the middle and the lower end, it increases substantially. Um, but I think this is something we can go through. You know, this is touching on confidentiality, um, but happy to go through it in detail. Yeah, no, I just wanted a broad view. I don't want you to give me specifics at all um and uh, i, yeah, I mean, assume because sorry because house prices mean is 1.36 million where it's also not towards the 7 million as you said towards the bottom end yes. um i mean i just want to go to some of your pricing because you know, certainly, I think there's a at least a perception out there that your increases have been fairly steep, to say the least. Um, so, I mean, we were sort of looking on on some of the the sort of clearly places where where state agents go, um, and and as I, I mean, I understand. You know, inflation plus a fair chunk is is your norm in terms of increases, and has been for a fairly long time. Is that fair? Yes, I think that is fair. Because we just, I just went back, sort of um, picking up on on um, some of these property professionals' websites. I mean, the twenty eighteen, you know. It starts by saying the country's largest property portal. Portal is certainly aware of the unhappiness with their subscription increases, but you, the CEO, says their customers generally understand. And we get comments like outrageous, exorbitant, were amongst the comments from the real estate industry upon hearing of Property 24's latest subscription fee increases, meaning an average increase of as much as 20% and even more in the highest lead bracket of 20. 251 to 750 for sales and 
300 for rental increases. Um, I mean, there's an individual who says he's gone up by 34%, but I think you come and say, well, 90% um, experience a 15% or less increase, and there's a category of about 9% to who are 20% or more, as I understand yeah. from 2018. Yes, I mean, uh, you know, look, it's, um, it is complex to talk about the price increases in a, such a short um, space of time that we have uh, in this hearing. Um, it, it is complex. And the reason it's complex is because of our matrix structure. So, for example, um, if you look at the end, uh, the price increases have been very low to the extent that I think uh, multiple years in a row we've given zero increase at the at the bottom end. Where where price increase and, and this is the complexity with property 24 when you talk about price increases because you're not talking about a single number, you're talking about brackets and the matrix. And so which bracket are you in and where where have you been affected? And so yes, certainly there have been large increases in many of these brackets and. The main reason is because um, there's such there's been such a disparity between the cost. If someone is paying, you know, at the bottom a 400, 400 rand, and someone uh, is paying um, a one and a half, let's just say, you know, one and a half thousand rand at, uh, at, at, an, at an upper level, but the person paying one and a half thousand rand is getting a thousand leads, um, well, then the, the discrepancy is just is just too big. So you have to um, you have to match your pricing with value that you're providing to the market, and that's what we've done. And because it's because it's been done over many years, each year you're trying to get closer to value effectively, and we're still not not really there. But what you're doing, what you, what we try and imagine is we try and imagine ourselves um, uh, getting closer to the power curve. So the small guy pays. A little bit, and the big guy pays more. Um, now it's difficult to achieve that. Yeah. So, th so moving to 2019, um, you know, we 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 again have a headline: industry reacts to property 24 price increase, um, and and apparently the dear valued customer goes out letter goes out um, about the increase and it starts with highlighting how much traffic there has been and the growth in that traffic um, and in this particular year it seems what irked some of the subscribers they say was that new changes in the pricing structure such as the introduction of a new price lead bracket splitting the 50 to 250 lead bracket into 50 and 150 and 150 to 250 and according to um, a Kathy Richings boarding horse from principal estate agent of Hillside Properties, this meant for some agencies an almost 50% increase in their fees. So as you say, some may be hit differently to, to others. Um, it, it, is, it is very complex when you talk about individuals because you have to, you have to look at that individual <coughs> at what their total spend is and, and evaluate the increase like that. You can't just look at it, um, you know, on its own. However, um, there's good reason why that segment was split because it was very unfair. If you're a person who's at the bottom of that segment and you're, you're on the 50 lead area and then you've got someone, at, you know, who's getting five times that, you're paying the same price. And that's that's the reason why we split that price bracket. Um, Ms. Bardenos also actually complained about the fact that views of their contact numbers were counted as leads generated, even though this number is far fewer than the actual calls, emails, or SMS leads they received about the listed property. Yes. So, so I mean, it's not a Mr. Manning complaint, but it's generally saying you view the number, that doesn't mean I actually get a call. So what we try and do there is um, is where, uh, where customers really don't <laughs> believe that providing value um, what we do is we implement call tracking or, or we we can we, we actually sell call tracking at cost um, because we would prefer that estate agents all had call tracking on the portal but they don't they don't necessarily want it what call tracking does is um, instead of you know um, relying on the click um, you can actually record you can measure and record the actual call as it happens and, and we would much prefer that model it's what right move uses in the UK um, now what we what we have done in the past with agents who are very unhappy about um, 
the perceived value is implemented call tracking on their account for them to see what calls they get and then to measure them against the leads. And generally speaking, we end up in a range of, you know, 60 to 70, 75% of clicks end up in calls. So where do the others drop off? Um, they might have called, they might want to call later. They might have written down the number, uh, et cetera. Anyway, what, the main point here is that, um, is that we know that not every click results in a call, and that's not what we're selling. And that is why we've made it so clear in our contracts and with our CRMs and our salespeople, we insist that the customer understands the basis of how we charge and what we charge. It's very important for us. Obviously, we, get, we still do get lots of issues of people not understanding or complaining about it. But I mean, if you know that only 60% result in an actual call, why don't you discount that by 40% when you actually um, count the number of leads? Because you know this. Because, we, because, we, because we're not selling the actual, if we were selling the actual lead, we would price it differently. But we're not. The product we're selling is in the contract here. The product is, as you've signed the contract, a click to see the agent's telephone number. And the price is associated to the product. If you sold a actual call, the product you would be selling would be different and the pricing might be different. Yeah, I think I think your your contract obviously explains that you're going to count as a lead uh, and expose of the contact number. But I think what agents seem to understand is actual leads and calls. And that doesn't mean an actual sale, obviously. Um, I think we heard earlier that there are many contacts that that need to go through in order to have a have an actual sale so i'm just putting to you you know that that clicking on that doesn't result necessarily in a call and you know the proportion you've tracked this um would that not be a much fairer basis um no but the customer knows it as well and we've made it extremely we're at pains to make it clear to the customer so all customers are aware of it. It's in our, it's, it's right here where you sign. We actually, we've actually made it standard practice that the customer has to sign this clause. There's a underneath that clause there, which is very, very clear and explain to them verbally. It says here, I confirm that I've specifically read and understood and understand the portal lead definition that forms the basis of the for sale subscription pricing model initial here. They initial it. So, they do understand what they're buying. They understand the product they're getting. That doesn't mean they're necessarily happy, but um, they may understand it, and you may want to make them sign it so that uh, there's no disputes later. When you get a Miss Bardenhorst who's who's not happy that the fact that they charge for more than the calls they got. But let me proceed I've, I've to had the experience of dealing with many, many um, happy and unhappy uh, estate agent customers, and so I can relate. I know, and I, I wouldn't want to be you because it seems March is quite a stressful time um, as the increase is announced and, um, and your, your unhappy ones come forward and you go out to defend it. So, I mean, March 2020, the headline is how long can Property24 increase rates in this way? But uh, I suppose, you know, it's a bit like Groundhog Day here. Um, every March, the same dear valued customer letter comes through. But in this case, we're told that the South Africa's biggest property portal has had subscription price increases in some instance of between 50% and more than 300% over the last four years. Is property 24 adding value or milking the cow? That's how the article starts. And obviously, I you may disagree in, in, uh, with that but yeah I think, I think that the 2020 price increase was eight percent across the board if i'm not mistaken um and um and i think that all of these things and i think that when we sit in camera and when you know when we we're, when when i'm not bound by a confidential etc we can look through all of those price increases and and understand them and understand what impact they've had on which customers wear and then you get a much better idea of what's actually happening you know, on our end. However, um, the price increases have happened because the market, where you know, the, the, the market, when you go back to 
uh, I don't know, 2012 or, or, or that period then, I, I don't recall exactly when. The pricing in relation to the lead, the value, pro the, uh, the value created was extremely low. It was way, way out of, out, of, out of line. And so we have increased pricing in line with value creation. And why we're quite confident, we're quite confident our, about our pricing. I, I'm not embarrassed about the pricing that we have and the price, the price increases that we put through. I'm very confident about them. Why is it? It's because when I look at our competitors and what our competitors charge, I see them charging much more. I get so mad when I see someone paying private property more than what they pay us. <laughs> You know, nominally more. I'm not talking on a cost per lead. I'm saying that the actual total amount they pay, or paying, you know, someone like IOL Property, I don't know, 500 rand a month, where they deliver nothing. So, you know, these things are all relative. But I'm confident that we provide good value. Yeah, and it, it, it yeah, may be. Maybe that, add that. Uh, sorry, Mr. Nicklin. No, no, please go ahead. I didn't want to interrupt you. I just wanted to add to. Uh, please add. Context. So on, on the point on the call tracking uh, and on the, the, the conversion from clicking on the phone number to an actual lead, I think it's very important to highlight that this functionality is driven by the consumer. We don't know how a prospective home buyer will approach an agent. If it was up to us, ideally, all of them would fill out the form and we would have full transparency into what they do. But our job being to facilitate the consumer, we have to offer a function that was just discussed here. We don't know if that call actually gets made. So in our quest to facilitate the final consumer, the prospective home buyer, we need to offer the uh, phone number and we opt to be fully transparent to our business clients by showing the clicks or by giving through the phone tracking um, the ability to have full insight into which calls actually happen. So I think that the point that this is in the end driven by how a consumer, a prospective home buyer decides to engage with our platform, this is not a consequence of, let's say, commercial optimization on our side. This is because our job every day is to allow South Africans to engage the way they want to engage. And therefore, this is our problem. And we're dealing with that problem by providing transparency and by giving alternatives to make sure that we can do call tracking. But this is not driven by us. This is driven by how a consumer would like to engage with us and with an estate agent. Thank you, could Mr. I, Mr. Um, could I add, Mr. Hodge, on our pricing, um, because you've raised the increases over years, that, um, that if we today look at the amount of money that estate agents are spending with us, and you divide it into the amount of commission that's being generated in the South African market today, it works out to about 1.5%. So estate agents are spending 1.5% of commission. So think about that. If I'm selling a 50,000 rand property, it's costing me 1.5% to list, not more than list, because we're talking about all of the revenue they're spending with us. Now, that doesn't seem like a very high marketing fee to me. And that leaves a lot, of, a lot of spend on the table to go and buy websites and list with competitors and support the market. Yeah, and I think you put that in your, your presentation as well. I mean, obviously, we'll interrogate that. But the question often, you know, for the competition authority is, is around what would be the pricing in a competitive market and would it look like this? And we can obviously have that debate, um, but the whole point of of ensuring a degree of competition and contestability is precisely that proper value is maybe you know determined. It might be that moving digital means actually the cost should go down substantially compared to print, and and be even lower. Uh, so that's the kind of thing we've got to look. But I mean, this is a, a market inquiry, as I reminded Mr. Mbuela as well. You know, we're looking at features of the market, how prices are charged, transparency of advertising, as you would have heard, and no doubt, you know, we'll get to. But so I think there's a range of things we're just looking at, which is, you know, not necessarily about dominance. It's just to understand. And, and maybe in addition, just to say, you know, the point of a sort of inquisitorial process is to precisely 
dig and scratch a little deeper and see if there's anything there we should be worried about or not. Um, but we, we won't get there unless we sort of scratch around. Um, so I just want to, to continue. I mean, in this year, I suppose, I mean, this is all responding by you. You say the largest number of customers are in the less than 1.3 million and 51 to 150 leads bracket, which is now priced at 2,822 per month and has increased by 14% per annum since 2014. So I'm assuming that's 14% every... Um, you do say you think it's cheaper than, than the nearest competitor. I assume that's private property. Um, but I just wanted to go to to the difference, and you alluded to it earlier, but but I noticed your slide didn't put up the different prices in the different categories. Um, so I don't know if you are embarrassed about that or or you felt it was confidential. But it's not confidential, and and we, we we it's it's part of our Annex A subscription fee. Um, I haven't so seen Annex A, but. So Farina, in response to property professionals' queries about their price increases, says the price increases need to be evaluated in the full context, and that's what you've been telling me as well. Um, for example, the category 1.3 million to 2.5 million greater than 1,500 leads, subscription cost has gone up by 26.6% per annum since 2014. Um, so that's what you indicate. Uh, but you say this may seem excessive on the face of it, but you say the cost per lead in this category is still quite low. At around 8 rand 20 per lead, this bracket is more than five times cheaper than the bottom brackets. And that's what you've been indicating to us as well, that Correct. it's substantially also, cheaper. Yeah, and also, you know, we view um, Google cost per click as, as also quite a constraint on us because um, um, if an estate agent... You see, estate agents, we do see that estate agents bid on cost per click on Google in their area. They don't have to compete nationally. They can compete in only the area that they're in. And if an estate agent can get a lead to their site from Google, um, you know, at a cost that's less than what we are providing, then, you know, that's not good for us. So the Google cost per click and cost per lead model creates a restraint on us as well. Yeah, and we'll come to Google. Google has obviously loomed large in all of this um, inquiry, mm -hmm. and we had them before us in the first week. But, I mean, I just want to go back. You're basically your bottom bracket compared to your top bracket, five times difference. So your smallest agent, the cost per lead is five times. That's what I, this is. I don't have that, that particular article in front of me, and I don't have those stats in front of me, because I think you said that is from two... When was that from? I'm... I'd have to find that article and, and, and read it and understand the context and the, and the data. Sorry, you can obviously, but I mean, this is saying Farina, in response to property professionals' queries, this is what they say you said. Um, I mean, you know your pricing, so can you tell us in the 1.3 to 2.5 category, the bottom versus the top, are we talking five times roughly? Obviously, that's 21 now. It may have changed slightly. You can't do it that way because the top is open-ended. You, you know, it's, that's why I need to understand. I need to look at that response and see what I was talking about. I mean, the top brackets are greater than 1,500 leads. And, uh, you and know, I assume you would just take the bottom of that, which is 1,500. If you had more than that, it would be even cheaper. Yeah, so, so again... Uh, uh, there's a big differential. If you, if what you're asking, is there a big differential between the cost per lead of your bottom bracket versus your top bracket? The answer is yes. Yeah, I mean, the reason I'm raising this is you've been at pains in your presentation to lead us through how much you do for SMEs. But of the smallest category, there is a massive difference. It's not a small difference. And even if we look at your rental, which you were willing to put up, you know, the difference in cost per whatever slot is is not, um, you know, maybe it's, I don't know, 30% higher for your bottom category. Um, 
25% versus we your for sale where there is extremely different pricing. But we just, we just had private property on here and their, highest, their lowest price is like 50% more than our lowest price. Look, just because they're bad doesn't make you good. Um, what we're looking at here, I mean, Mr. Farina, and to be fair, you know, Property Central, I think, painted a rather bleak picture of the estate agent industry in this country where it is predominantly white owned. And I don't think that is, you know, disputed as I read out to, you know, to Property Central that the the numbers from the announced under the from the state agents advisory board are horrific um, and there's been transformation efforts allegedly for sort of 15 years that have seemingly come to absolutely nothing but small historically disadvantaged estate agents starting out so they're new entrants so they're going to be in the bottom bracket are paying five times yes it may be few agents in the top bracket but that's the difference in leads. And and I just want to yeah, put it to you here because, in fact, in this article, we have um, uh, Noeli Suatini, founder and principal of Noeli Suatini Properties, who's concerned about the portal's high price increases that make it difficult for new agencies, particularly if they are without strong financial support, to list with them. And they, they say these kinds of increases are creating a discriminatory environment to the haves and the haves not. This is an era whereby we talk transformation in the real estate industry sector, but moves like these are denying that opportunity for new property practitioners who do not have the privilege of old money to play in the industry space. We all know that for anyone to succeed in this industry, you need advertising money and an accommodating platform to expose your properties. So Tini asks, how new and young estate agents, especially from previously disadvantaged groups, are going to be able to advertise on this platform? You know, I think the advice is I urge them not to close doors to the young and new practitioners who want to have a role in the industry. So that's in the article. And, and so I'm just putting to you that this is a substantially untransformed industry. Small efforts... Um, you know, of taking 50 agencies under your wing is great. I'm not going to deny that, but it seems the structural barrier is far greater when we look at the fees. And and I think, you know, part of our mandate is looking at, at whether part, equal participation in online platforms, either as a business or as a platform provider, is, is something um, that is happening that's part of the public interest mandate that we have. Um, so it is concern for us, I think, when this is the voice we're hearing. Um, but let me allow you to respond. Yes, yeah, so I, I think, you know, I, I can't argue with that, is that the industry needs to transform, absolutely. Um, we don't have, unfortunately, we don't have a very good site of transformation in the industry because we just don't have the numbers and we've never collected racial information about our customers so it's it's been hard for us to identify hdps on our platform um, however our platform doesn't discriminate you know we don't see hdps um, as as different to smes um, we see smes those are our customers our, our customers are all smes and our platform doesn't discriminate against that what our platform recognizes is that if you're a customer that brings more listings to the platform you're more valuable to the platform, and that's what our pricing is based on. Because I've got to build the best possible platform for a consumer to come to, to stay in business. And if you're a, an agency with a thousand listings, that has value to me, and it has more value to the platform than it has for an agency with five listings. That is why the pricing is like it is. You know, when you talk about the five times, it, ma it makes it sound dramatic. But someone starting on our platform will spend 463 Rand a month. Now, you just take the commission of, let's take a, an area like I looked at, Sochanguve. I was looking at 800 to 900,000 Rand pro properties in Sochanguve. Work out the commission. The commission rates at that level are actually higher. So work out what the commission is on one of those properties 
and figure out if a, if a, if a smallest uh, HTP estate agent starts a business, how many properties do they sell in a year? And then look at the fees. The fees that we charge at the bottom, if I think just, you know, at the top of my head, are equivalent to, I think, I think that you would be able to afford about seven years of property 24 fees if you made one sale, something in that region. How can that be, how can that inhibit anyone? I think the industry is telling you every year when the price increase comes through, there are major complaints, but it seems, you know, as you indicated, you are the, the largest platform where customers come and and so it seems it's very difficult not to be on your platform but we even heard earlier that you know this sort of one to two percent is is possibly quite different for the smallest of of estate agents so we need to look at the i mean we'll obviously explore that with you in in camera if if need be on what basis you've made these calculations but I suppose agents have a range of costs, um, and uh, and many don't earn a salary. It's what that sort of commission is actually the salary um, that they're trying to earn. Can I just add a few points again? Um, I think to your point on the relevance of marketing costs, uh, very fair point. But, but you're speaking today to the platform that, at least as far as we understand, gives any estate agent in any sense the biggest bang for their buck uh, to spend. So I hear your point, but I think it's important to realize that in the end of the day, any dollar or sorry, any rent spent on, on Property24 probably creates more value for that estate agent than, than that same rent spent anywhere else. I think the second point on sort of the difficulty of price increases, uh, fair, like we'll, we'll probably wait for the day where, where, where price increases are welcomed. Um, that's going to be far out, I guess. But at least the structure of our pricing is based on alignment with value. And I think that is a really key aspect of our pricing structure. It is relatively risk-free for anyone and cost-free for anyone to try our platform. So, so we actually might see this quite the opposite. We believe that the way we price actually makes it very easy, also for uh, state agents in the in the smaller segments, to participate on our platform. And that's a very different pricing structure than, for example, competition deploys, where you don't have that strength, that same correlation between the value that we bring. And what we price you, if we do not bring you value, independent of where you fall in the spectrum of size, we will not charge you. And I think that's a, that's a really important thing that I want to highlight here. We price in line with value. You know, value is one of those business terms that are so amorphous around what it means. But I think that, I mean, Google will say the same. And yet everyone says how much this sucks out, but you go there because there's value because they do generate a lead. And this is almost the point of of the this sort of, I'm going to use the word dominant platform where you've got the customers and so you can charge. And yes, you've got the customers, so the leads will come. Um, and you can call that value. But I suppose, as I indicated earlier, there's a question that competition authorities raise, which is how the you know, how would this look in a more competitive scenario? And, and I mean, you, you also heard this morning and, and I can't confirm it, but you know, private property is more inflation based increases. You may say their pricing structure also hurts small business. Uh, I, I put it to them too. Um, and it seems they've introduced a few products in recent times, um, and may introduce more, but but I think, you know, Mr. Farina, just generally we can rationalize our behavior and our pricing. What we are looking at, as I said, is about the impact of that and whether there are features that inhibit competition. And that could be competition amongst estate agents. It could be participation amongst 
So whether we've rationalized it or not in a particular way, the questions we have are, what is the impact, you know? And that's what we need to, to certainly explore. I, I hope think, you understand I think, that. I, no, I understand it 100%. I think the commission will be pleasantly surprised by the impact. I just wanted to go back to the dear valued customer letters. I mean, as I understood from, from, from these, you start off with how many unique users you've got or how many users you've got and how much has been the growth in traffic um, before you drop the bomb on, on what the increase is going to be. And that's your, I suppose that's by showing the value that you're bringing. Is that right? Uh, what is the question, Mr. Hodge? I, I'm just, as I understand from these articles, your your increase letters talk to how much traffic has grown on the platform and how many, I think, users on the platform there are as the yeah, reason right, for... Many different letters, and they might talk to different things. Sorry, from this 2019, that seemed to be what what was um, discussed. Um, I mean, I'm just interested why a reference to traffic, not leads, if leads is what you're selling. Well, I think um, leads is not the only important metric of a, of a portal. You've got to remember that um, estate agents they're not only there for leads, and they don't buy promoted products for leads only. Um, there's a very important component, which is branding. So estate agents used to, they used to brand locally on bus stops. Um, they still do, in fact, uh, schools, uh, etc. And in much the same way, they would like to create some branding in the area on Property 24 or on private property, wherever they are. Um, to create brand awareness for themselves and to build brand awareness. So, um, you know, if we look at, at traffic, for example, at just traffic, ex ex excluding leads, there is a value in traffic on its own because this is top of the funnel. This is top of the funnel traffic. A, a large amount of the audience might not be in the market for a home at that stage. They might just be browsing. They might just be looking at really beautiful homes or aspirational or um, dreaming or whatever. And so it, it might, there's a, there's a component of our audience that, that, that is simply browsing content. And in that respect, um, an estate agent's brand is there generating brand awareness. So that can be uh, an important aspect of it as well. And that's what I understood from your presentation that there's a, you've sort of attracted this large following of casual, um, what visitors to your site. Um, you know, looking at, I don't know, dreaming of houses um, and and the like. So it's not just about serious buyers coming to your site. Yeah, I think that's a fair assumption. And, and obviously they're not bringing leads because they're not serious buyers. They're just looking at nice houses and and that's deeply satisfying for them, but it's not going to result in a lead necessarily. Uh, yes, correct. It could it could in future, uh, depending on uh, you know they might see a they might be aware of a brand. Uh, they might see a house that they liked from a certain brand, and when they do decide to get into the market, they might remember that. If they're selling, they might remember that agent's branding. Yeah. So, so as I understand your your response is that's payment for branding, um, because if I had to look at I suppose you know leads per se. I mean, what, what what we did look at is, is it seems the number of houses sold every year has been sort of flat to maybe a marginal decline over the last sort of four or five years. It may have changed in the last year um, with the sort of COVID bounce, but, but certainly over that period where we were talking about the increases, I mean, as I understood your earlier statement, leads are kind of correlated with listings and therefore you know, if there's only so many houses being sold, it wouldn't seem that list, uh, leads have grown over this period. Well, they have. So the leads per listing has grown. 
So we we produced even even though listings might not have grown, we've produced more leads per listing. But that may be the click on the phone number type lead, which which we de debated earlier from the casual viewer. Um, I'd be interested to hear more from the estate agents, and obviously in camera we can look at your actual leads um, over this period. But I suppose the, the flip side maybe to put it to you is for estate agents, they're not selling more houses, um, but their advertising costs are going up at, well, at least 14% per annum um, for the last six years in the most popular category. So I think, I think you know, it's multidimensional. When you start talking about the estate agent and estate agent business, um, you've got to look at, at many facets. So the first thing is, when you're looking at number of houses sold, what numbers are you looking at? Are you just looking at the deeds office top line? Because that doesn't necessarily reflect um, the core estate agent industry. So not all of those properties are sold by estate agents, firstly. Secondly, um, government plays a large part in the transfer, in the numbers of those transfer properties, right? By um, transferring large amounts of properties to, for example, um, RDP housing, et cetera. So those numbers are obscured and you've got to segment those numbers into, into where they actually are um, formally taking place. Because the other, the other problem there is that um, there might not be transactions happening that should be reflected in the deeds office as well. But it, so the deeds office data, what I'm trying, just trying to say here, get across here, is that the deeds office data is complex. And when you try and analyze the market using it from the top, you know, it, it does get quite complex. What we've seen post COVID is we've seen um, a booming market because interest rates declined. And we've seen estate agents have said to us they've had their uh, best year. A lot of estate agents have told us that they're having their best year ever. However, when we look at the deeds office data, it shows a decline in total value. I'm talking about the pre-COVID period where, I mean, everything I've read certainly says the housing market was fairly depressed because you didn't have the the COVID bounce from a low interest rates and and a bit of pent up demand from obviously a period mm. of un, huge uncertainty as I think you alluded to earlier or, or Mr. Maguela did, I don't know. But in the previous years, I mean, we were slipping into recession, it was a bleak and, and all we've read about the housing market is it was fairly depressed. Um, so that's the period I'm talking about with the price increases, not the post-COVID. Yeah, so so I think um, I think that in those prior periods, you've had, if you look at, and this is why I'm saying, it's hard for us to understand what's happening in um, in the estate agent businesses in, as a general industry. But what I would surmise is that their print costs have declined substantially and has declined much more than what um, uh, online costs have increased by. So I, th I think that the online that the estate agent industry has gotten a lot more efficient because what online has allowed them to do is, for example, it's allowed them to get rid of offices. It's allowed them to operate virtually. It's allowed new models like lead home, discount brokers to come into the market, et cetera. So it stimulated competition quite a bit. Um, I think, you know, the other thing I think you've just got to be aware of is, um, is, yeah, I think I think that coming off a low base of cost in online uh, has also contributed to a lot of that increase over that period of time. They've come off a very, very, very low cost base. I think what JP is alluding to here is that you started the question by saying agents' marketing costs have risen. And I think this segment that we're focusing on here, uh, online marketplaces like ourselves and private property, um, definitely there has been more spent on those platforms. But we would hypothesize that if you zoom out and you take a, a larger time frame, um, including the historic spend on offline channels such as newspapers, we believe that actually agents cost agents spent on marketing might have not risen, uh, partially because of the increased efficiency that platforms like ours bring. 
But I mean, that's the precise benefit of moving digital is cost should come down and finally the consumer yeah. should benefit. So using print costs as a benchmark for your own pricing is I think missing the point, you know, and it's about the share of value across from the consumer. So if estate agents are allowed to drop their costs, then consumers should also benefit from lower commission fees. Um, and if digital is a more efficient forum uh, form of advertising than print, then advertising costs should come down. You know, that's the sort of benefit of the online economy it was meant to be. So, so I just think comparing continually to print and saying, well, that's the benchmark we should use. I don't think is a good benchmark. No, sir. I, I might not have been very clear that I wasn't comparing ourselves against Sprint. I was just trying to paint a picture where there's multiple advertising channels. And over the past period, there has been a huge shift uh, from less efficient channels to more efficient channels. And by zooming in on that part um, where that has been the recipient of that shift, it is very, it's almost like logically impossible not to have that as a more relevant part of the total spend. Mr. Farina, I just want to go to another part. I mean, a statement you made in this response to property professionals, I think it is, on the the 2018 increase. Um, so it just states, he added most of these... Sorry, let me just dial back to give you context. So... Um, this was you responding, so according to Farina, those with 20% and higher increases make up 9% of Property24 customers, and you highlight the, the tiered category. Um, and then you proceed to say, and this is in quotation, the customers with the largest price increases are also those who get the most leads and whose cost per lead is extremely low when compared to the average, and we, we've been there. So although in percentage terms, 9% of customer increases look high, in real terms for a larger office, the subscription fee is actually very low when you take into account the cost per lead and the actual subscription fee, which I think is the story you're telling us as well. But what interests me is you, you go on to say, he added most of these large offices also buy additional products from Property24. And according to him, in most cases, the additional spend is far higher than the subscription fee. So if you take into account their total spend, the increase is substantially lower. It's a bit like the the last one, which is, this may seem very high, but look at what someone else is paying. But you're saying that the spend by these large offices is substantially higher than the subscription fee. So I assume that is the featured listings, the premium rankings, the branded listings. That's the value-add services that you provide, that they're buying into. Is that right? It, it could be any of any of the services that we sell, but yes, it, it, it might include promoted listings. All right, because, I mean, that does suggest that this has become a big part of your business, at least. So, yeah, it's become a part of the business, yes, correct. A big part of your revenue stream now? Uh, you know, look. If we if we start talking percentages, I, I, I would I would claim confidentiality. Um, I know that this last the la the financials that you have are difficult to look at because of COVID, because we gave away two months of subscription revenue, so it will look larger than what it actually is. All right, but it's I mean it's not insignificant. No, it's not insignificant. Correct. And I'm sure we can get the history if there's a COVID effect um, from you afterwards. Yes. I mean, I'm not going to dwell on the transparency issue. You've clearly listened to the previous, um, you know, interviews and, and, and I'll just obviously just repeat that, <clears throat> I mean, as we understand, not many of the local platforms seem to tag advertising. Um, it's clearly become more of a norm globally and and it's something we'll obviously um, look into quite carefully but I mean I suppose what interests me is is that this has become a sizable part of your business because obviously this is paying for visibility um, 
and it may rotate, but, but it's still about getting visibility on your platform. I mean, that's what I suppose it is, or branding, as you may, may say. Yeah, I think it's it's you know it's about positioning exposure. In fact, I think different customers buy those promoted products potentially for different reasons. Some might buy them because they're trying to attract uh, for sale mandates. Some might be trying to build their own new brand uh, in an area. Some might feel that it does increase their um, their leads. Um, you might do it because you want to sell a property faster. Um, it'll still sell on the platform because people. You know, uh, I think <laughs> whether a property is promoted or not is not, you know, if, if just because a property is at the top of a list is not going to make a buyer buy it. It's not, it's not an iPhone. No, I'm sure, but it must have some effect, as you say, selling faster or generating more leads um, because outside of looking for branding, I mean, that's why people buy it. And, and I suppose you wouldn't tell them it doesn't work because you're selling it to them and you're selling yeah. value. So, so it must do one, one of a few things. Um, yes, correct. I think the main point is that it, it's probably um, it, with this product, these products, the eye, the, the, you know, beauty's in the eye of the beholder. The, the, customer, the customer is looking for you know, what they want out of the product. And, sorry, is that the uh, customer being the estate agency? Yeah, correct, yes. All right, but I mean, it works to generate more leads or, or to sell faster. Well, I mean, I, you know, we think it's effective uh, to an extent, um, depending on what you're buying it for. All right, but you don't, I mean, you're selling this to them. So presumably, you know, you're saying, look, with, I don't know, premium listings or featured listings, you know, you're going to get X many more leads. We've done the maths and this is worth it for you. You kind of got to show the value in the end. Yes, correct. All right. Um, yeah, and look, I can theorize as an economist that maybe more leads means I'm more likely to find the buyer who values this at the price I've sort of put it. But uh, I mean, I just wanted to understand that it does actually do something at least. Sorry, I just want to take a maybe it seems a bit left field as well. But um, I mean, on the transparency, I suppose it's very noticeable now for most people who browse websites that you have a cookie policy that asks you what you want to subscribe to or not. Um, and again, it's interest to 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 contrast what maybe standards elsewhere in the world. But I mean, as I understood, your cookie policy is, doesn't give that choice. It's just, you'll explain it, but um, there's no choice. Yeah, the reason, the reason for that is that we decided, we made a decision quite a while ago to just simply remove all tracking cookies. So things like Facebook, um, anything that could do like a third party, um, a third party a tracker, we, we, we took out. And so we don't require a consumer to, you know, to, to check that, to, to switch it off. All right. Now, that's interesting. Um, I just want to go to to prop control. Um, and I think you had a brief slide on that around content. And as I understood, this is list you'd presented numbers on listings on your site as i understood it so where do they come from and that may explain why uh, private property had a different view to you uh yes correct they, they might also have been doing their numbers by agency as opposed to listings i'm not sure i mean what proportion of listings do you have compared to the total universe or don't you know um, we we don't know um, the the only place where you could the, the best place to look for the total universe um, pains me to say is actually the aggregators because the aggregators um, collect listings without any fee and so what the aggregators do is 
They scrape estate agent websites as well as portals. And they also implement feeds where they can. Um, and because they try to aggregate as much as possible for free, um, there's no inhibition on, on what they have on, you know, on, on their platforms. So um, it's, it's a little bit difficult to tell because we don't bother with trying to compare to them because it's very hard because you, you, you have to synchronize, you have to have your areas synchronized. You have to understand duplicate listings. Um, it's, it's quite a complex task. Sorry, maybe they're scraping old content too. Um, those rental properties that never got shifted off. So yeah, probably. They may. But I mean, you are. I mean, you you are the largest um, portal. So I assume you have a high number of these, um, as much as anyone else. Well, we we hope so. I mean, we try. You know, we try. We try to. I mean, to give an example. Uh, we. You know, when we look at at, uh, at, our, at our competitors, um, we find estate agents that are not on Property24, as per Mr. Manning this morning, and we try to you know approach approach them and we try and convert them into customers constantly. Um, you know, so so we know that we don't have them all, and we know that we don't have all the listings. I just want to understand the the prop control fee structure. Um... So, so what is it? A monthly fee that you pay to manage your listings, and this is separate no, from the website. No, prop, prop control is part of your subscription. So, as soon as you take a subscription with P twenty four, you have access to prop control. All right, so it's basically f um, a free part of. Um, yeah, it, it depends how you look at it. it. You could view it as part of the cost of listing with us and take the benefit of it. You could look at it as prop control free and, you know, my listings paid for. All right, but uh, that's what I just want to understand. Um, and it's separate from the website development where you charge a fee for that. Yes. But it can service that website, obviously. Correct. It, it can service a website, uh, our website, and it can also service an estate agent website. So it can also uh, feed to the estate agent's own website. I mean, if you're building a website, can I just understand? And you, so I'm an agent who comes to get a website, and I don't list on Property Twenty Four. Do I get prop control for free as well, or am I charged for that? No, we we would we don't sell websites if you're not already. We don't sell websites to non-property twenty-four customers because it wouldn't make any sense for us. Um, we, we're leveraging off the the platform that we have to to build your website. All right, and and what if I subsequently delist? Would you continue to service my website? To be honest, I don't recall if we've had a case like that, and I don't recall if I don't know if we have a business rule like that. So I would have to find that out. All right, I was just curious. Um, I mean, we were told this morning by my property, Mr. Javier, that that he was charged or his clients charged five hundred rand a month inbound fee by Prop Control. I mean, is that right? Yeah, so the the, the listing um, ecosystem or environment is is a little bit complex, and and it's it's evolved over many many years. Um, and um, Mr. Kruvia is correct. Um, private property also charge that fee, incidentally, um, although they said they didn't, but they do. That what they do is they ask us, they they force us to collect the money on their behalf. Um, so uh, what, what happened in the past is, look, we maybe if I go back a little bit in history, we started building prop control. We didn't build prop control as a multi-feed system. We never envisaged, that's not our core business. We never envisaged a, a system that would feed out to other platforms. We always built, we built prop control as a back office system to assist our state agent customers, to add value to our state agent customers. And if you look at prop control, um, it's actually a mandate 
and customer lead management platform that has a marketing kind of tab where you can feed to Property24. Um, obviously, we, we integrated it with a feed to Property24. Over the years, we, we had customers who wanted to feed to other platforms. The first one um, you know, was IOL, I think. I think we've, we've, we've fed to a few platforms, but there's only two left on, on there now. And as we, as we got customer requests to feed out, we did add them in. We had a lot of um, we had a lot of demand for people for us to feed out to private property, and we approached private property. Um, I think about I don't remember the date now, but we approached them and said, "Look, you know, we should just interoperate um, feed feed ins either way because it, it's going to make it easier for the industry," and um, and they actually agreed to that, um, and so we built a feed out to private property, um, and in fact. They only built a feed back into us two years later, um, a, a kind of a reciprocal feed from from Fusion. But um, but these feeds are quite complex because they require quite a lot of investment, and it's not just a one-off investment. Um, it's constant. It, it, there's a constant operational cost for you to manage a feed and an API into any other platform um, and from any other platform into your own platform. We we we've never seen ourselves as building a multi-feed uh, platform and charging for it. Mr. Kravir's business is that. That is the core of his business. The reason why he has customers is that multi-feed. Sorry, Mr. Farina, I just want to go back to the question, which is just the inbound fee. So it's not about mm. you feeding out. I just want to know why you charge to get. Yes, yeah, so, sorry, my apologies. I drifted there. So what what started what started happening over time was we started finding a lot of different um, customers moving between um, platforms or software platforms um, to feed into us. And what this started doing is it started creating a lot of technical support on our side. And so so just to 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 paint a, a bit of a picture here. Let's say we had a customer on prop control and there's never been any issue with them. And let's say they've got, uh, you know, a thousand listings um, coming in there and they contact us and say, look, we're moving to um, a third party platform. We've now got to hold their hand to migrate all of their data to the third party platform. We've got to make sure that they synchronize properly. It's, it's quite a lot of work. And we've got to make sure that it all switches over correctly and then feeds correctly from the new platform. And the new platform has to seamlessly work with our platform. And so we do these these uh, migrations, but then that customer decides the next six months later or a year later, whatever. No, 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 I'm moving to this new platform because these guys are better. And then you go through that whole process again. And so we have smaller customers and large customers actually chopping between a lot of these platforms. And so we said, no, no, no hold on a second. You know what? You can change platforms, but if you change platforms, there's a fee that you're going to pay to us to manage that or to 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 cover the technical and operational support that we have. And that is the inbound 500 rand fee. I mean, from looking at your slide, apart from individual agencies, which as I understood were the Pam Goldings and I don't know, Remaxes of this world, there are only um, four others, Prop Data, Independent, Fusion, Private Property, Integral and Webbox. Feed ins. Software uh, multi-listing systems, or what, for other what? Well, this is on your your slide, which is it's about the source in, of content. Feed in sources, yes. yeah, feed-in sources. So, I mean, just to be clear, there's not there's not hundreds here. We're just dealing with four. four Apart from the legacy, but the problem is not that. The problem is not the platforms. The the, the work comes in with customers chopping and changing between platforms and all the issues that come up with migrating data, uh, synchronizing data. There's a lot of technical issues that happen. So that's with a once-off cost. Though. I mean, if there's only four other platforms and you're getting feeds from them, I mean, maybe you can charge a customer once-off cost of you, but as it's I understand, you're charging them 500 rand Yes, Mr. Month. Hodges, not cost it's um it's it, it, if we have a, a a platform like prop control that works extremely well and is integrated well with property 24 
and a customer moves to a third party platform, um, there are constant technical, there's constant technical support required for that third party platform. So it's not a once. Can I just it carries ask, on. Uh, These things pop and change all the time. Can I just ask, um, do you charge private properties, fusion members, the same 500 inbound fee? The, 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 actually, the, the ruling that we have on it is that you don't get charged. At, I think we introduced it at a certain point because we want to stop the chopping and changing. And when, that was sorry, causing... when did you introduce it? Uh, I don't have the dates at hand, it but it was a few years ago. A couple of years ago, right? Uh, I, I don't know if it was a couple or a few, but I'll, I'll get, I can get the date for you when we introduced it. But um, at the time, we said, look, you know, if you're feeding from your platform, that's fine. We're not going to do everything. But if you move, if you migrate platforms, then a cost will come in. And so we don't actually have that many customers paying us that fee. And private property did the same thing. They said that any any feed coming from property 24 would attract a 500 rand in, inbound fee as well. And what did you mean by... You collect money for private property. I just want to understand well, that. Property, you know, after two years of us feeding to private property, I, I, I eventually, um, I got, you know, I, I, I got hold of the then CEO and said, "Listen, you know, this is just really not on. We stuck to what we agreed to. We fed out to you, and you guys have not reciprocated. You haven't, you, you haven't agreed, you know, um, to to open your feed back to us." And he then said, yep, okay, you're right. It's actually time that we did integrate, but this, these are our terms. And then we negotiated terms on it. And the terms were that we would have to collect the fee and pay it over to private property. Who are you, sorry, who are you collecting from? From the oh, customer. So, so we have a customer customers? using prop control. All right. Yes, so we All have right. a customer using prop control and that customer now elects, yes, they want to feed to private property. We now have to charge that customer 500 rand, and then we have to pay private property 500 rand. They bill us for those customers. Uh, I must admit, I find it a bit bizarre, um, you know, and I'd love to dig into the history of that. But uh, I mean, why can't private property just bill them? It, it makes no sense. I agree 100%, yes. We did it because our customers were really wanted to feed to private property. We had a lot of demand for it, and so we buckled to private property's uh, request, you know, uh, commercial terms. And it's the same fee that you charge inbound to to your platform. Yeah, but it's it's uh, our, our fee is based on a switching of platform. Can I just ask? I mean, do you charge an inbound fee in Namibia? We heard earlier that that my property is sending you listings there. No, Namibia is not a commercial entity for us. It's um, we have several. Look, we we did we did open up some international um, uh, businesses. Um, we have not had any commercial uh, entity in Namibia at all. All that we did, um, we we envisaged that we might open property twenty four in different African countries. And so we created sites. We opened up, opened it up to be free for estate agents to capture listings, but we have never ever commercialized them at all. So just so I understand though, you'd go through the same hassle of linking with another platform, but you're just not gonna charge a fee in that case. I, d I don't know, because I, I don't know what I would do if, if you know, if um, Shirt came to me tomorrow and said, JP, what do you, you, you need to build a business in Namibia, I'd get on a plane and go to Namibia and figure out what I need to do. I'm just saying you, your business goes through the same sorry, technical process, but but you don't charge there. That's uh, I, I just I don't understand that. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I actually, I don't know. You know, I think Mr. Gravier was saying that he allows a feed to property 24 in Namibia. Um, and I, he might well because because we allow him to feed into property 24 and it's the same platform for us there's no difference between whether it's namibia or, or south africa it's just if he has a if he has if his software can feed into our platform then it can automatically feed to namibia 
and I just wanted to establish, and maybe you can just say yes or no, whether you charge an inbound fee for Namibian listings, yes or no. I don't know if we have any inbound uh, listings from Namibia. So it, Mr. And Korea it says be, he sends you would, listings. Then, it, then the answer would be no, because we're definitely not getting any revenue from Namibia. All right. And I suppose this is the, the, the strange thing for me is, you know, obviously listings are important, as you say. They're one of the four pillars, or well, the starting pillars. And, and I assume you're grateful that another, um, what do we call it? We've had sort of listing engines or syndication software, but wh whatever term we use, you're very happy to in fact engage with some of those because it in fact facilitates you getting listings. I mean, there's a benefit to you. Is that not right? Correct. I think so, yes. It seems there's no reciprocity here, you know, and, yep. and as you say, I mean, I mean, I don't think you dispute that you don't send to Property Central, my property, and many others. Um, but but why is there no re reciprocity? You mean from prop control? Yeah. So it's interesting that because. Um, because so I think firstly is we've never really considered prop control to be a multi-listing software. We we've never invested in it, you know, and thought about making it a a proper, you know, multi-listing software to compete with Mr. Crevier or Prop Data or any of those guys. We thought there there was always a place in the market for third party independent software to fulfill that that gap in the market. And also we haven't really had requests from our customers to feed out. And and, I, and because of yesterday and today's session, I actually went and did a search. I asked our GM and our ops team and support to please look for any emails that have come from Property Central and any requests that have come from Property Central, and we can find nothing. We can't find any, you know, any request for a meeting or request to feed out from Prop Control from Property Central. And then, I, then you know, Mr. Crevier also mentioned it, and I went and looked up correspondence with Mr. Crevier. Now, let's just remember, or, or, or just, I think, important to, <laughs> for the commission to understand, Mr. Crevier and I have known each other for a very long time. He's got my personal phone number. He's got my personal email address. We're LinkedIn connected. And yet, in 2018, uh, Mr. Crevier sent an email to our GM that says this, we have just launched a new My Property website and invite you to offer a free interface to your prop control real estate clients to increase their market reach. Feed options available, and then he gives a list of them. There is no fee from Integral site. My Property is a free to list portal. Please let us know if you would be interested. Questions, let me know. Now, that was an invitation to feed out to him. And our GM just said, well, thanks for this, Adrian. Uh, you know, looks very nice, uh, we, I, we won't take up your invitation. So, you know, the, it begs the question, Mr. Crevier is adamant that we won't feed out from prop control, but he's never approached us for a business meeting. But I'm sure we'll get all sides of the story um, eventually. Um, you know, certainly we've heard from Mr. Jigaru and Mr. Crevier around this, but I mean, factually, you feed out to to what three other platforms as far as i'm aware we feed out to iol property which was historically you know one of the, the biggest and and that's why we had demand and private property and i actually i i'm not aware of anyone else we feed out to the i mean whether you set out to be a a syndication or not i mean i think you must accept if you offer prop control free to your clients and you estimate 41 percent of your listings on prop control and and i assume no one's using two listing softwares so uh, no no they are they are all uh, right. you, you can't assume that mr hodge they do use multiple listing software as well all right but at least 41 percent are sitting with you um 
and and it's free when they subscribe to 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 property 24 i mean uh, i would i would sort of understand that is well if you're not offering the integration there's a fairly large number of of estate agents who effectively don't have that option to list elsewhere beyond private property and IOL, unless they go through the additional cost of another listing software, which of course is, I think, maybe a disincentive. Well, look, look at it this way. Um, Prop Control is free and Fusion is free. And so they're paying a single software license to list everywhere if they go to a third party. I mean, it was interesting that you mentioned earlier that you sort of came to an arrangement with private property. We'll just integrate, I assume, because they had a lot of listings that you wanted and you had listings that they wanted. So there was a mutual interest. No, no, that wasn't what I said. And I think I did answer the question. We had customers that wanted to feed out to private property. They, we, we had lots of customers who constantly complained that prop control couldn't feed to private property. And so we enabled it. There was, no, there was no arrangement that we came to. We got hold of private property and said, we would like to feed from prop control to your platform. And we negotiated it and they said, yes, okay, we will allow you to. We then asked for a feed from Fusion into pro pro property training for which they didn't give us for two years. But you felt that was a fair quid pro quo. I mean, if you're gonna feed to them, they must feed to you. Uh, yes, I mean, I think I thought that it was a fair pro 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 because there, there's costs on both sides. And so if I'm going to incur the costs of integrating into their platform without them incurring any cost, then I would expect them to do the same for me. That's what I think is, I suppose, interesting for me that, you know, in the internet service provider space, this has sort of evolved into peering where exactly I've got some listings or in the case of ISPs, information, websites that that you may want and you have some that I want and we sort of peer in common areas and share and that's what makes the, I suppose, the internet work ultimately. But, but one could look at this in a, a somewhat similar way. You know, you want the sort of listings from other software providers and, um, and they want from you. If I can just jump in here and, and, and give an answer, not on the sort of tit for tat of the exact history, but more on, on general principles. I think for our strategic view, for us to be successful, having easy access to listings for all market participants would be a great thing. If you look at the United States, uh, because there were references to Zillow in the past, where there is an, an MLS, a database with all listings, access to listings by the portals is actually easy. And we would welcome a similar structure like that in, in the South African market. It's obviously not up, up to us to, to define it, but I think the principle of easy access for all market participants to listings mm -hmm. is something that we would definitely subscribe to. Uh, so we don't see that that's capturing or listing as a strategic part of our business model. Well, I'm pleased to hear that, Mr. Nickton, because I think this is one area then we'd like to engage you further on how we how we reach that point. And if you have experience from the US, how that happened, um, you know, or how that emerged, because I would agree with you. I think if listings are just fundamental for entry, then then one wants to do it. It may be that that you need consent from estate agents and there's other elements, but uh, but I'd be pleased to to get more information yeah. from you as to how you see this might happen. We're very open to engage on it. I just want to point out that in, in the US, this is not so much a reflection of the portal industry there. It is much more a reflection of how the fundamental real estate marketplace works there. But the concept, I think we are, we are very open to. All right, well, we'll better understand that with you um, and how that may be facilitated here. Sorry, Mr. Farina. May I just um, make one more comment about, you know, you you you, um, you spoke about the the ISP kind of metaphor and, and just why this is not the same is because 
Um, the listings that we're talking about here already exist on Property24 and already exist on private property. It's just that the customers are capturing twice. So it's not that suddenly the two, the, uh, Prop Control and Fusion now um, uh, talk to each other and all of a sudden there's a flow of listings that happens. Those listings were already on both platforms. These are customers that are irritated because they are capturing in different platforms. Yeah, and I think that's precisely the point, that it's an irritation and uh, a hindrance. And that's, you know, I think that's why, why I'm exploring it, because as soon as it becomes a hassle, well, then maybe I can list for 99 Rand on my property, but God, the hassle of capturing twice means I'm not going to. So it may be a, a market feature, let's say, that might hinder competition in yes. in the market. And one where if it was solved, that might, in fact, facilitate competition and improve it. Because I think our very first inquiry into banking, you know, one of the things that was looked at was switching costs between banks. And, you know, I think consumers are essentially, obviously, averse to effort um, unless it's really needed. And so part of that inquiry looked at how do we facilitate that. So again, switching costs even between providers, I think we need to look at more carefully and whether that 500 Rand a month is is um, essential. Um, I was reminded um, by Mr. Mwela that I should look at the international side as well. And, and you had mentioned that you thought you might set up in other African countries um, I, we've heard that Namibia is not a commercial model, but what would be, I mean, is, is, is expansion still on the cards and what would be some of the, the barriers that keep you from successfully exercising that option? Um, so, you know, we were, we, we were interested in expansion earlier on, uh, you know, in, in, I think in our, in our, in our lives, um, at property 24. Um, we 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 would look at other markets. They would have to, you know. I think that the 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 problem that we have here is that we're a very small part of a of a very big company, being OLX and Naspas, and a market like Namibia, um, or another or another African market like, for example, Kenya, etc. They're still relatively undeveloped, and they're they they're not going to for the effort required for us. They're not necessarily going to. Um, uh, they're not going to present the opportunities that that the group might be interested in. And I mean, just so I understand, because you know, to much fanfare, we launched the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, and physical good movements obviously is the target for that. I mean, it's easier to go and set up a digital platform in Kenya. Um, so that sort of initiative, are you saying, may, may not change it? It's more what's the level of market development and commercial opportunity to warrant the investment? Yeah, I think we would always look at the, at the, um, at the potential opportunity, you know, in, li in light of the investment required before doing that. And I think that in our group, um, you know, we, we would probably, we would probably find other opportunities um, that, that were better suited for investment. And maybe just to add, I think there's a lot of symbiosis between healthy property portals like us and the underlying uh, state agency market structure. So there is no success for one without success for the other or the other way around. And markets like some of the ones you mentioned, but also uh, others that we have operated uh, in, oftentimes lack that basic market structure for a portal to do a, to do a good job and to add value. I think that's, that plays a big role here. So it's not so much commercial, it's also our ability to actually make a difference in that market. Exactly. So one example is Nigeria, as, uh, where we did have a portal presence and we really struggled. We struggled to um, to increase quality of listings and, and, to, um, uh, and to moderate and, and to create a decent experience. Um, Kenya, Kenya, we also launched a presence and it's actually done fairly well. Um, but Kenya is, is just a very small market, and we've never commercialized there. The, the cost, the cost would probably be too too high for us to just become, um, you know, loss making. 
uh, so you, all right, so you have launched in, I mean, relative to international competitors, would they face the same investment dynamic? You know, is this worth it? Um, or do you face any particular barriers coming from South Africa? Um, look, I think that the beauty of, of the digital world that we live in is that is that you can compete, um, you know, cross-border with costs in one country and opportunities uh, in another. And, um, you know, it's a double-edged sword. On, on the one hand, um, we did, for example, compete, we did launch a business in, in Philippines, which is which still exists, but we sold it, uh, Property 24 Philippines, where we competed and we took our platform and our model and we um, partnered in Philippines. Um, and uh, um, and so, so that was an example of us going out and, and, and trying to build a business externally. Um, likewise, though, the, the, the double-edged sword of the other side of that is that it's very easy for international competitors to come into our market and compete. And, um, and we've been lucky in South Africa um, in that um, the South African market looks like a small opportunity and generally the international uh, players don't necessarily understand it and don't understand how to size it. And also it's a small, it's just so small in relation to the markets that they're in. So if you look at the European players or the Southeast Asian players, for example, um, the REA group might be a group that would have entered South Africa. Their roots were in Australia. Um, they've bought uh, uh, multi-country portal platforms and businesses in, in uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, etc. And um, and so you would think that, that that could be a group that would look at South Africa and say, hey, that could be interesting. But I think timing-wise, um, luckily we've managed to build a, a, a businesses here ourselves private property um you know the, the smaller players and um and so i think that that we're more able to defend this market now going forwards but that is our worry is that a big international player comes in and disrupts us and, and maybe just to add one point here i think there's the elephant in the room here is, is actually facebook and where um we and other potential entrants in markets might not be able to make it work depending on the underlying market structure. They compete uh, with an audience, of course, multiple times our size uh, that came to them at, at no cost for launching these businesses. So for them, the whole, um, let's say, um, prerogative is, is, is different. Um, and, and that I think is a topic that we have discussed way too little here that is also impacting uh, our business as property, private property alluded to, to earlier, but specifically in, in the types of markets, not South Africa that we were just discussing, uh, you, you might end up in, in a situation where competing by portals like ours and, and, and our competitors in the same business is impossible, but for a player like that uh, is very much possible and therefore basically preventing any form of competition. Uh, and I'm sure we will be in contact with Facebook to to sort of look at that. Um, and I'm sure in an in-camera session, you can expand upon that um, in more detail. It's, it, is, it is, in my perspective, the most relevant large force that has been to discuss too little in, uh, in this audience. Uh, I just want to see if anyone has any burning questions. All right, Mr. Um, Farina and Mr. Nicolin, thank you very much for um, coming and participating in the public hearings. Um, you know, certainly I think it was an interesting discussion and we learned a lot and we'll take it forward in the, in the more in-camera sessions as well. Um, and I would ask Mr. Farina that you don't give up on that dream of digitalizing everything because it takes about six months to transfer your, your rates from one property to another, and certainly that would be appreciated. We all have a dream. <laughs> Ms. Hodge, um, and Ms. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to really thank you for giving us the opportunity to present, and, uh, and also just the engagement um, you know, has been uh, really, really positive uh, you know, with the Commission. And we look forward to the in-camera sessions where we can uh, you know, further um, get into these issues and, and, and figure this out. Great. Well, thank you. And, and with that, we are closing the, the session for today. Um, tomorrow, we I just want to check with the team. 
We're, we're just waiting to confirm, but I think we're moving to um, automotive classifieds um, with Autotrader and CarFind in the morning and Cars.co's in the afternoon. Um, I had indicated to the participants that I had to attend a cabinet meeting tomorrow, but that got suspended or, or, or pushed out to next week. So we're hoping to get them back after I turned them down. Um, but hopefully we'll see everyone tomorrow morning and we'll carry on the conversation about classifieds. Thank you very much. He's going to leave first. I think this is the end.